to everybody. Matthias, I will start off and after the first two introductions, then I'll let you and I go take uh, the rest of it when maybe you can divide. So maybe about, uh, I think how many, five plus two, seven talks today. So 20 minutes each, that's what we said, the Imad, 20 minutes and five minutes for discussion. Actually, yeah, we, when I sent the co-responders to all the speakers, I said half an hour and... Uh, oh, that's fine. Yeah, um, yeah, half an hour. And I told it inclusive, so no extra time for this. Okay, so okay. they should be yeah. one or two comments. If it you was give, great yesterday. yesterday. But yesterday eventually was it, it yeah. was only <laughs> the mistake of the, the two co-chair. We all both were one hour earlier. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm you were already starting. So <laughs> but it's better to be safe than sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's better to be safe than sorry, yeah. Professor Ugo Ture is here. Hello. Professor. Hello, how are you? Hello. 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 Professor. Hello. 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 Hi, Ugo. Hello. Good to see you. Nice to see you. I Hello. can see the sunshine in Istanbul. Yeah, wonderful. Right. Today. <laughs> <laughs> so yesterday the attendees uh, or the watcher, there were more than 700, I think the first 10 hours or something like this, which is good. That's fantastic. Great. Great. Yeah, and uh, Ramesh, before you start, I might take two minutes to introduce Absolutely. what I did yesterday. Absolutely. So it's simplified things to present yeah. them shortly and then yeah. you proceed. Yeah, sure. I don't know if any of them there for presentation, if they want to check any of their presentation or video during yeah. this time. Pablo, is, I think it's starting, right, Pablo? Professor Ture wants to... To check okay. it. Okay, that's Hello, fine. Pablo, how are you? Good to see you. Very good. Let to see try you. my video because last time it was not working. You know. Please, so, please, please it's please alone. It. Yeah. You have to share your screen. Yes. Thank you. Uh... Where is my? I don't see my. Share screen. Hmm. It should be a green button. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, when I put share screen, it shows something else. Yes, then you, you have to click accept. Uh, you will see many windows. Click on desktop and accept. There is desktop. No. Oops. Uh, there is a uh, security problem. I see. This is new my uh, computer. So uh, how I can fix this? Maybe you have to enable uh, some stuff. It's a Mac, I guess. Yes, this is iMac. Yeah. Uh, so if you go to, let me check it. System preferences. Uh, this is something else now. This is interesting. Maybe if you go to um, uh, system preferences and then you click on security and privacy, there is something called firewall. Just one second, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, security. And privacy, and uh, there are general firewall. Uh, firewall. Is your firewall on or off?
Yeah, it was. Yes, now. Not working, Professor? Yeah, I find the file wall and I try to open. Yeah, now open. Yeah, and let's see now. Okay. May I see? <laughs> Share screen. Still, it's not. So it needs some time to uh, reboot. Yeah, okay. Open it. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> no worries. We have it's new computer and I am using first time. And uh, no worries. I think we have time, Imad. I think uh, Professor Ture is third or fourth. Yeah, I'm third one. He's a third. Error. <laughs> what if <laughs> the technology is destroyed our life, you know? <laughs> yeah. you know th that's why we are happy. A robot will never take over. <laughs> so I just share for the, the link for YouTube in case, because uh, now the, the room is full. <laughs> so we have other speaker on the panel. They want to check their presentation. Roy is already here. Roy, Roy you want to check? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's cool. Is that OK? Yeah. It's fine. It's on the screen, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. We see your slides. Yeah. Fine. Fine. Pablo, sí. may I check my presentation? Hey, please. Did you see it? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. okay. 
Uh, is Theodore there? Theodore Schwartz? I um, can't see Theodore. Um, um, yeah, we we'll close the screen sharing. I think if you're happy. Yeah. I'm going to make you co-host, Ramesh, if you don't mind. Yeah, that's fine. Um, it's our tradition. <laughs> Uh, Ramesh, if Theodore is uh, not uh, on time, I can speak instead. And, uh, okay, all right. Just in case. That's fine. I mean, whenever, uh, Imad, we can start. I think it's uh, um, four minutes past um, the, the start okay. time. So I'll just put, uh, if I can share one slide with you guys. Oh. Do you see my slide? Not yet. So am I privileged to share? Um, but I'm, I'm, not seeing, I'm not seeing the green button on my... Um, you should be able to share because you got the uh, permission to share. Okay. Yeah. All right? Yeah. Hmm. You see the slide, I think? Yes. Um, yeah, we can see the slide. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening uh, for all the attendees around the world. Uh, welcome to the 10th webinar, day two, the scientific session. That session is dedicated for functional neurosurgery. It will cover movement disorder and epilepsy. Uh, proud that there are several members of the committee contributing to these activities. And the um, session will be moderated by my colleagues, Professor Ramesh Naive from England, uh, Professor Matthias Baldoncini from Argentina, and Professor Igor Maldonado from France. Uh, both they are uh, uh, competent uh, stout neurosurgeons, and they are going to moderate this session. We are pleased that several speakers have accepted our invitation. And uh, we have Professor Pablo Gonzalez, a member of the committee, a vital member of the committee, actually. And he is a consultant and professor at uh, a nice place where we'd like to spend some summer uh, with him in Alicante, Spain. He's directing uh, hands-on courses there, and he is uh, directing the uh, lab for uh, neuroanatomy there. Uh, we have Professor Theodore Schwartz from Presbyterian Hospital in New York, an astout neurosurgeon with a, a track record in uh, a minimal invasive neurosurgery, pituitary surgery, and uh, of course, functional neurosurgery. Um, Professor Hugo Ture from Turkey, a friend, a brother, and a colleague, and a contributor to our webinars, a frequent invitee. And we are proud to have him, and he is going to share his experience uh, with uh, uh, amygdalectomy and the different approaches. And he will have uh, 40 minutes uh, or 45 minutes, since it's actually two topics. He's going to join them together. He's from Istanbul, and he's the chair there. Of course, so with the uh, father of microsurgery, Professor Yazerji, with him. Uh, we have Professor Roy Daniel from Switzerland, a member of the Neuroanatomy Committee, and he, has, he is the deputy chairman there, and he's running a Neuroanatomy uh, Functional Lab, and he's going to talk about functional hemispherectomy uh, for epilepsy. Uh, this is the interesting part, which is hemispherectomy rather than the anatomical resection. Uh, we have Professor Giovanni Bocci. He is uh, a member of the committee and he is 
uh, second chair for the European and the part of the World Federation, and of course, part of our committee. He is a chairman emeritus from Milano, and he's going to talk about uh, management of tumor uh, uh, with the subject comparison to DBS. We have Professor Philip Kobes uh, from France, uh, a well-known uh, neurosurgeon uh, dealing with functional neurosurgery and movement disorder uh, with a uh, profound experience in management of these cases. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Igor Maldonado who made the link with Professor Philip and he will uh, join us on this uh, seminar. And last but not least, uh, uh, the world we know uh, uh, neurosurgeon, functional neurosurgeon who has contributed tremendously to the advancement of this field, Professor Andre Lozano from uh, Toronto, uh, Canada. Uh, and he's going to talk about movement disorder, the trend and options. Uh, without further ado, I will pass the further introductions and the moderation to Professor Ramesh and the team. Ramesh. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. That's uh... A nice introduction, and uh, without further ado, uh, I'll just uh, going to invite uh, my close and uh, very best friend, uh, Pablo from Alicante. Every time when I listen to him, I, you know, all of us learn new things. So, so clarity, I mean, he's very keen to impart that clarity of knowledge, especially anatomic knowledge to the listeners. Um, so Pablo, um, you can start off and any questions from the uh, audience in the Zoom meeting can type in your questions and the the question and answer session. So either during the talk or after, after it, they could answer the question directly to you. Thank you, Pablo, all yours. Thank you, Ramesh. I started sharing. I don't know if you can see it. Yes. So uh, thank you, Ramesh, for the introduction. Thank you, Imad and Vladimir, for uh, continuing your effort and putting all these fantastic uh, webinars together. And uh, uh, I was privileged by uh, Professor Imad Kanan today to, to talk about uh, limbic system anatomy and surgical planning, especially in tumor-related epilepsy. And uh, let me start with something very emotional for me. I, I am sure I wouldn't be here today and uh, I wouldn't reach the experience I'm reaching without uh, the year I spent in, in Istanbul, Turkey, under the supervision of Professor Ture. Uh, he really changed the way in which I, I think, he really changed the way in, in which I see our specialty. And uh, you can understand how, how happy I feel today uh, to share the, this, this panel with, with him. I will just uh, uh, share with you some concepts uh, that I, I, I truly got uh, during my stay in, in Istanbul. So I cannot thank you enough, Professor, today uh, for all your help during the, that, uh, that year. Indeed, uh, most of the cases and the anatomy, anatomical dissections I am going to share uh, with you today are uh, mostly inspired on my, on my work there. Well, let's start with the limbic system uh, and the, the word limbus, this is the first concept I, I learned, uh, means the edge. In this case, it means the edge of the hemisphere because all the limbic and paralimbic structures as we will be discussing today are located in the interhemispheric fissure and in the basal aspect of the hemispheres. And this is not by accident. This has, has been happening during 500 million years. And the, 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 the stress for the survival the environment and the mutations have been changing our central nervous system. So the limbic and paralimbic areas have been pushing by the telencephalic uh, tremendous development to this edge of the uh, interhemispheric fissure and the uh, mediobasal aspect of our brain. So this is how it looks like, and this is a, a diagram which is coming from Professor Yasser Hill's uh, book uh, in which we can see the, the most important structures from the limbic and paralimbic lobes. This has been always confusing for me, but there are some texts like this one in which the different structures are classified according to the different layers of neurons and the development of these new ones. So we can have olfactory and hippocampal areas on the limbic lobe, and parahypocampal cingulate areas on the paralimbic lobes, and also some uh, areas which are located in the insula, in the orbitofrontal uh, cortex, and also in the temporal pole, which are closely related with this paralimbic lobe. So why is it special? Uh, it's special for many reasons. The, the most important one is the different phylogeny uh, of, these, of these regions, but also we can see that the vascularization and especially uh, uh, the pattern of the uh, arrangement of the fibers is very special on the limbic lobe 
because all the fibers located here are located are arranged like a, a, a belt, like a semicircular uh, uh, belt. So that's mainly because of the tremendous development of the diencephalon, which has been pushing these fibers away from their origin. That's why most of these fibers are arranged like this. And something very important is also the pattern of uh, connection between the both hemispheres, which is mainly coming from the anterior commissure. So if we try to summarize the most important areas of the limbic and paralimbic areas, we can have the mesocortical, proisocortical, and allocortical regions, uh, which belong to the paralimbic and limbic lobes. And I will try to share with you some cases of a tumor-related epilepsy on these different areas. Let's start with a region which is not purely limbic, but paralimbic, which is the anterior aspect of the insula, the anterior lobe of the insula. And this is a 31 years old lady who came to our clinic with scissors, which were quite well controlled with anti-epileptic drugs and some personality disturbances. So we can see a tumor which is mainly located, as you can see here, just around the limen insula, which is the area connecting the insula with the uh, perirenal and renal cortices. But you can see how the posterior aspect of the insula, the long gyri, are completely preserved and pushed posteriorly. So this is a purely uh, tumor located in the antero inferior aspect of the insula. So this is mesocortex, and this is part of the paralympic lobe, mainly located in this area here. So how would you approach these tumors? We have to try to, to think on a, 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 an approach which will uh, release the pressure and will give us the chance to, 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 re, to resect as much as possible of this insular tumor. As you can see, this purely insular tumor has opened the fissure for us. So this is a perfect case for a transylvian approach, just splitting a little bit and opening the arachnoid on that layer. Important issues to consider are the location of the fibers surrounding this tumor. So we have the arcuate posterior superiorly, and we have to imagine where the corticospinal tract is located. In yellow, we have the arcuate, and here we do have the IFOF, which is really important, especially in this uh, dominant hemisphere for language purposes. So that's why, again, a transylvian approach is going to be something quite, quite safe for our patient. So as we will see, we start uh, just opening this arachnoid and the tumor is right there. So we can work in two windows, temporal or frontal in this case. So what do we do? And uh, this is the first, one of the first things I, I, I learned in, in, in Istanbul, try to de divulge and de decompress as much as we can the tumor and then look for the uh, limits in the superior peninsular and inferior peninsular suicide. As we are moving posteriorly, there is always a dangerous area, which is the, the, the most posterior part of these tumors, very close to the corticospinal tract, exactly here, which is something that uh, we should be very careful about because the corticospinal tract is quite close to this, to this part of the, of the lesion. Let's move to a different one. And now we are moving to a different limbic, uh, especially paralimbic area. So here we do have the limen insula, which was the place where the tumor was growing. And now we are moving, as you can see, this tumor is not also only growing in the insula, but also invading the temporomysial area and also the frontal orbitary gyri. Also, the gyrus rectus is completely preserved and also the neocortex of the temporal lobe. So this is a perirenal region, uh, mainly located in the renencephalon, quite close to the anterior perforated substance. And why this tumor is spreading like this, thanks to this ancinate fascicle, which is connecting the temporomysial with the frontal orbitary gyri. So this is a tumor which is mainly located in the antero uh, uh, insular, in the posterior orbitofrontal gyri, and also in the temporal pole, especially in the temporomysial regions, mainly located in the amygdala and head of the hippocampus. So this is a paralimbic tumor, and in this case, there is no way to go transylvian. In, in my uh, short experience, it's much better to go transopercular because the tumor is invading the frontal operculum. In this case, I, I, I tried to split the sylvian fissure, as you will see, in order to face the tumor, but finally I decided to go through the temporal pole through T1 in order to reach it. So this is the right telional craniotomy. We are opening the dura, releasing some CSF after opening the fissure, and then we uh, place our electrode to control the, uh, the corticospinal tract. We try to open a little bit the fissure, and finally, we start our corticectomy in the so-called planum polare, and here we are reaching the temporal pole through this transopercular resection. This is the insula itself after removing the temporomysial aspect. This is P2, so this is the ancus, and this is the tentorial incisura, so it means that we reach the amygdala and the head of the hippocampus, and now we are moving to the frontal orbitary gyri through the 
basal aspect of the pars orbitalis, we are entering the tumor and we are gonna try to connect both structures. Here we have the carotid artery with the lenticular striate arteries and uh, this uncinate fascicle should be over there, connecting this frontal orbitary with the temporomysial area. And the uncinate is indeed completely invaded by the tumor. Now I'm moving again to the temporal window where I want to resect the head of the hippocampus in order to try to control the scissors of, of this patient. And this is the final result. The patient was doing quite well also, he had a very small infarct on the internal capsule, which luckily was not clinically uh, important. But what I want to show you in this post-op is that uh, we have removed the part of the insula, we have removed the temporomysial aspect, amygdala and the head of the capocampus, as well as the temporal pole, and also the posterior aspect of the frontal orbitary gyri. But we are sparing the neocortex of the temporal lobe, the parahippocampal gyrus, and also the gyrus rectus. So we are mainly removing the posterior aspect of the orbitofrontal gyri, which indeed is the area where this glioblastoma was growing uh, a few months ago. This is a young lady, uh, if I remember well, 57 years old lady who had this uh, tumor with headache and very important personality disturbances. And the tumor, as you can see, is mainly growing uh, from the posterior frontal orbitary gyri, invading probably the septal region and pushing the cingulate gyrus, as I will try to show you after the resection. So this is clearly a tumor located in the posterior orbitofrontal uh, gyri and maybe invading the olfactory and septal regions in the most posterior aspect of, of itself. So it's a paralimbic limbic tumor. And in this case, uh, the, the, the approach I chose was a subfrontal one. So this is a quite unifrontal uh, uh, lateral supraorbital approach. We are approaching the base of the frontal lobe. So we identify the frontal orbitary sulci and now we start our resection, trying to develop as much as we can of this tumor. This is a small craniotype, but it's, it's going to be, as I will try to show you, very, very interesting in order to deal with the most medial and the most lateral part. This is the uh, optic nerve. This is the olfactory nerve, which is, of course, completely surrounded by the tumor itself. And this is the sylvian fissure seen from the frontal aspect. Now we are again moving to the most posterior part trying to separate the olfactory from the optic nerve is the carotid. And uh, here we will see the most posterior aspect of the tumor in contact, close contact with the sylvian fissure and also in the interhemispheric fissure. So this is the contralateral gyrus rectus, that's A2. This is the optic nerve I'm cutting right now. And here we have, we have a nice view of the interhemispheric fissure with both A2s. This is the final view uh, after the resection. And this is uh, why I want to show you the post topic that the cingulate gyrus, which is part of this uh, limbic lobe, is completely uh, preserved by the tumor. And here it was just compressed. So it's an important concept to try to understand. This is where the tumor was growing, mainly posteriorly growing to the septal region. But here we can have a tremendous number of different cingulate uh, uh, tumors which mainly are approached from an interhemispheric approach in order to reach a cingulum. We can go ipsy or contralateral, whatever we feel more comfortable with. And these cingulate and parahippocampal uh, tumors are made of periarchicortex, which is mainly paralimbic lobe. So cingulate, most of the cases, an interhemispheric approach is the ideal one. But as you can see, the cingulum is uh, continuous from ismus with the parahippocampal gyrus. And there is a very important difference. Once we are moving posteriorly from the cingulate to the parahippocampal gyrus, this gyri is moving laterally and uh, inferiorly. So the interhemispheric approach is, gonna not, is not gonna be enough in most of these cases if we want to reach the most anterior part of the parahippocampal gyrus as we were facing into this case. So this is a tumor which is mainly growing in the parahippocampal gyrus, as you can see, but also invading the hippocampus and partially the most posterior part of the parahippocampal gyrus in connection with the ismus of the cingulum. So this is a tumor which was growing in these two different functional areas. And for this purpose, this is the anatomy we must try to preserve as much as possible. The IFOP, especially in the left hemisphere, the optic radiations, it's, it's much better if we try to avoid crossing them. So that's why, uh, and I learned again this concept in, in Istanbul, the ideal one, the ideal approach is a, a supracerebellar transtentorial approach. So as you can see, these are two important limbic belts that I want to mention right now. The external extraventricular belt, which is the belt made by the cingulate fibers and the parhypocampal fibers with an input of information through the olfactory nerve connecting the amygdala and the septal regions. And this is where the tumor is growing through. But also we have an intraventricular belt 
made by the hippocampus with the fornix, and finally the circuit of papets connecting the fornix to the mammillary body, and finally spreading through the mammillothalamic tract to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. And this is where the tumor is growing. So the tumor is growing in two different limbic belts. So that's why uh, uh, this approach is fantastic uh, in order to, to remove a, a tumor like this. So this is the kind of incision. This is in sitting position. We have a view similar to this one. And after opening the tent, we can approach. And we published recently uh, this how I do it with, with Roy Daniel in Acta Neurochirurgica. So this is the technique. Again, I learned uh, from Professor Ture, semi-sitting position. We try to release CSF from the cisterna magna. And we place always a cotonoid there. We try to open the dura as much uh, as possible towards the transverse sinus. And then we retract it superiorly in order to, to open the, the, the supracerebellar space. And you can see how, by capillarity, this cotonoid from the cister magna is helping us to release the pressure. Then we place a cotonoid in order to identify where we could do the opening of the tentorium. And uh, that was an ideal point. So this is how uh, I learned to do this. We open the tent in this L-shaped fashion that Professor Venice is always, always explaining us in hands-on cadaver courses. We have a look with the endoscope in order to make sure that we are not going to damage mainly the fourth nerve, which is quite posterior, but maybe we could have some variations. And then we attack directly the parahypocampus. We start debulking, take, taking some tissue, and this is the hypocampus, already posterior aspect of the hypocampus, as we have in crossing superiorly the parahypocampal gyrus. This is the choroid plexus with the endoscope. We can even uh, reach different uh, or difficult uh, regions, and we are entering through the uh, temporal horn. Here we have the ankle recess, which means that we have reached, reached the head of the hippocampus, and we are leaving behind the amygdala. As I have no longer instruments in order to deal with that. Let me show you this special case. This is a, a patient I had in 2013 when I came to Alicante. Uh, he's a, a bullfighter, uh, professional bullfighter. And he had this tumor mainly located, as you can see, in T3, fusiform, and hippocampal gyrus. T1, T2 are, are completely intact. And I had some doubts about the subiculum and the dentate gyrus, but if you have a look here, it looks like it's not invading the amygdala. In this case, I, I couldn't think of, on something different at that time than a transcortical, trans T2 temporal lobectomy. And uh, this is the final view we can get after removing the amygdala, which was supposed to be here. So this is the carotid become. P1, P2, the tentorial incisura, and the third nerve. And we tried to remove as much as we, we could uh, the hippocampus because the patient was having a very uncomfortable scissor. This is the post-op image uh, eight years later. He's doing fine. He's doing so fine that he wanted to come back to his normal work. And I insist on him that he should not. Uh, this is the, the visual deficit he's having. But he told me, Pablo, unless the, the bulls start uh, flying, I will not start, stop my, my job. So I, I, I couldn't complain uh, about that, that point. And this is a special case uh, we did during the pandemic time. It's a uh, 71 years old lady uh, with very uncomfortable uh, scissors. And you can see this tumor invading the temporal uh, lobe, the neocortex, but also the amygdala, as you can see here. And maybe this is the anchor recess, also the head of the hippocampus. But the thing is that she was having very uncomfortable scissors. So this is a tumor mainly growing in a temporal pole and also partially the amygdala, had some doubts about the hippocampus. So it's a limbic paralimbic tumor also invading the neocortex. So this is where the tumor is growing and this is the scheme we, we try to get in our mind, the ancus anterior aspect is the amygdala and the parahypocampal gyrus is completely free of tumor. So it's mainly located in T1, T2, T3 and fusiform uh, gyrus. So in this case, again, uh, we open the dura, we identify T1, T2, T2 very insufflated, so we start our debulking at that region. And uh, we then try to identify our anatomy. So we are moving now subpiously towards the, the, the inferior aspect, that's T3. So this is the fusiform gyrus. Sorry, it's in Spanish and the quality of the video is not so good. And this is the temporal horn, which is covered now with this cotonoid in order to preserve the Mayer's loop. We are moving vasally to remove the most anterior aspect of the parahypocampal gyrus and the fusiform, which is coming out right now. So this is the parahypocampal tumor, uh, gyrus, sorry. That was again the temporal horn. We are moving now to the ancus, and you can see how the ancus is completely herniated into the, into the uh, crural and interpeduncular cistern. 
So we are using the QSA in order to remove it. This is the head of the hippocampus, and this is the amygdala. This is the third nerve and PCOM. So that's where the amygdala was being pushed, the uncus being pushed, P1, P2, and finally we took part of the head of the hippocampus. This is the post-op and this is what I was doing during surgery, just observing uh, our uh, chief resident, uh, Dr. Enrique Luna, who indeed is uh, becoming a neurosurgeon next Friday. So this is my thanks uh, to him for his hard work and, and commitment during the last uh, five to six years. So this is the post-op image and this is very interesting. As you can see, we cut a uh, the tentopromisial area at this point, at the point of the uh, inferior choroidal uh, point where the anterior choroidal artery is centering. So this is the hippocampus and parhippocampus. And this is interesting because uh, this is one of the limits for the supracerebellar transtentorial approach in my hands, but I know Professor Ture can even read the amygdala. I have seen that and I, I guess we will see it later on. But this tumor was uh, growing towards and uh, till the amygdala. So this is the ancus, and we can make this pyramidal draw. So the anterior aspect is mainly related to the amygdala, the posterior aspect mainly related to the head of the hippocampus. And if we have this basal view, we can understand this much better as this is the dentate with the head of the hippocampus. Posteriorly, this is the ankle recess, which is the limit, the ventricular limit between the amygdala and the hippocampus. And generally, this is a good limit in order to separate what kind of approach we want to do. This is an uh, 18 months baby, uh, which came with very uncomfortable scissors in 2014 to our department. And this is a very special tumor, which is mainly growing, as you can see in three different areas. So it's growing in the temporomisial pole, also in the amygdala and in the head of the hippocampus. So this is the area of interest. And this is some important, these are some important fibers we want to preserve in this case, Mayer's loop. So uh, once we are reaching the most posterior part, we should pay attention not to go too superior and to enter the temporal horn from below. So again, terional craniotomy, opening the fissure. This was uh, seven years ago. Uh, I have no experience and uh, in some cases I, I still don't have it to go to Transylvian to reach this, this tumor, but I found very safe to go transplanum polare and in this case trans superior temporal sulcus quite anterior. So if we cross the superior temporal sulcus quite anterior, we directly reach the temporal pole and then we move posteriorly to the amygdala sequentially, and finally the head of the hippocampus, which is exactly what we are doing right here. So this is the third nerve. It means that this is the amygdala. We are moving posteriorly and superiorly to try to find the very difficult limit of the amygdala. And this is the head of the hippocampus. It is a post-op. I saw the patients of this, uh, of this nine years old girl this morning, and they told me that she is doing great, no scissors, no anti-epileptic drugs. And this is the most recent uh, post-op MRI. So amygdala, septal region, also they are quite far in anatomical terms, they are, they are very close in phylogenetic terms, and indeed we have something very important, which is the stria terminalis connecting them. This is the last limbic belt uh, I will share with you today, stria terminalis connecting the septal region and the amygdala. And uh, let me finish with two very fast and fresh cases. I did this case last week. This is a 47 years old man who came with scissors, and this the net, which is located exactly in the amygdala. So as you can see, is in the anterior aspect of the uncus, and the head of the hippocampus is pushed posteriorly. So this is mainly a limbic lobe tumor. Important fibers to know and to try to respect. IFOF, especially as we said before, in the dominant hemisphere. So we have to try not to go too superior uh, related to the element insula. And once we enter the amygdala, which is number one, we should try to respect this IFO fibers and the optic radiations. And finally, get into the uh, head of the hippocampus in case we need to control uh, some scissors. So this is how I did this case. I will show you. I did a small corticotomy in the most anterior aspect of T1. And then through the planum polari, I reached the temporal pole and the amygdala. So this is the left terrional craniotomy. And uh, this is the left sylvian fissure. We are releasing CSF starting by that maneuver. That's a carotid. So we are placing now the electrode in order to, to continuously check the corticospinal tract. We leave that one in the motor area. And we are using an intraop electrocorticography uh, for research purposes. These are the spikes we found in the first 15 minutes per resection. And then we start to split the sylvian fissure to go as deep as we can, but this was a quite complex anatomy full of connections. So I tried 
to give my best. That's the inferior aspect of limen in Sura, but finally I did this small corticotomy in T1, but it was very good in order to orient myself with the ultrasound and with the bifurcation of the MCA. This is a temporal pole already, so the tumor is invading that, that region. And now sequentially, we will go again from post anterior to posterior. So that's the tentorial incisura. That's the third nerve appearing there. So this is the ancus and the amygdala, what we are resecting right now, that's P2. So we want to, to reach the inferior choroidal point posteriorly. That's why we will be following and trying to identify anterior choroidal artery. That's the ancus, subpyre resection of the, the ancus. And we want to enter the temporal horn. That's the choroidal anterior choroidal artery, which is a very good landmark, as you can see here. So we follow it posteriorly to the inferior choroidal point. And here we have the choroid plexus we remove, in this case, the head of the hippocampus. And after this maneuver, it was very nice because we, we could find that the spikes completely disappeared after removing the, the dinette. So this is the post-op MRI in which I, I can see that I'm very happy, quite happy with the resection of this completely benign tumor. The patient is scissor free only one week after. And this is the last case I want to show you. Indeed, this is very fresh. I don't have the post-op. We did this case uh, yesterday morning before the, the webinar. And the, this is the same story. This is a glioma which was growing since 2019, slowly growing and causing very uncomfortable temporal scissors to this patient. And it's a tumor located in the amygdala, as you can see, purely amygdalar tumor. The hippocampus is completely free of, of that tumor. Something important I want to highlight, we have been talking about a, a longitudinally oriented a white mother fiber tracts, the belt oriented a limbic a circuits. And we have to introduce now the anterior commissure, which is indeed is running parallel and perpendicular to this fiber. So here we do have the anterior commissure connecting both temporal lobes, temporal lobes, and the amygdala. And uh, many of these tumors are spreading to the contralateral amygdala through this anterior commissure. That's why we can find in the EEG by temporal activity. And this is the commissure which is connecting not only the temporal lobes, but as you can see also the amygdala and the temporomysial structures, as well as the uh, rhinal uh, lesions, uh, structure, sorry, regions. And uh, this anterior commissure is a paleo commissure, which is present in all vertebrates, uh, different to the corpus callosum, which is exclusive of placental mammals. And uh, this is a dissection from my time in Istanbul, in which we were able to find this anterior commissure connecting both septal regions and bilateral, the temporal lobes and the, and the amygdala. This is the uh, a view from the infero the medial aspect of the hemisphere. So this is the rostrum of the corpus callosum, and this is exactly the, the midline. So this is where the tumor is located. I don't know if you can see this anterior commissure. This is the area of the anterior commissure. And in this dissection, from the right side, we can see after opening the anterior commissure, how these small fibers are connecting both amygdala uh, just at the level of the diagonal band of Broca, which is just below this, this one. So in this case, yesterday we decided to try a transylvian approach in order to, 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 to resect uh, purely the, the tumor to do a purely tumorectomy. So same concept, we open the, the anterior aspect of the, of the fissure and we try to identify M1 because M1 was a long one in this case. Here we have it. And it's giving us the relative location of the limen insula and the perfect entry point to the amygdala. So we take as much time as necessary opening the fissure. And this is a, a very, very early anterior temporal branch, which is something quite normal. And I guess I, I thought this was a good area in order to start the corticotomy. So I placed a cotonoid there and we had a look with the ultrasound. And uh, we realized that exactly we were quite close to the anterior aspect of the amygdala. So this is the cotonoid and this is the tumor. So we just needed to do a small corticotomy posteriorly. We place again. Uh, our grid in order to check what's going on during the resection. So we did the corticotomy right there in the most medial aspect of the planum polare. And then we entered the tumor, which was quite easy to, to, to remove, but we at some point used the CUSA. So again, we want to orient ourselves. And this is the most basal and anterior aspect is the ancus already. So we are pushing subpiously the ancus. We had the third nerve which will be appearing right there. This is the uh, carotid bifurcation, which means that we went quite anterior and we want to go posterior now to see the choroid plexus because it will mean that we reached the head of the hippocampus. 
And the most difficult part as we don't have a anatomical orientation is the superior aspect, which I don't know any specific rule in order to, to, to reach that area. And I guess it's a matter of experience. And uh, this is the sapphire section of the amygdala. We are moving now posteriorly and here we have the hippocampal head. So that should be Mayer's loop moving posteriorly. This is the choroid plexus and this is the head of the hippocampus which was also removed. So that's P2 and that's uh, the midbrain. And uh, we were quite happy with resection. I'm sorry, I don't have the post op MRI. Indeed, it should be uh, being done today, but the patient is quite fine. No scissors by the time. And uh, this is my just yes, slide. I just want to summarize that it's meant you have to spend as much time as you can in the lab. I do it, I try to do it as much as I can here in Alicante and uh, study, the, study the individual anatomy for each single case, think on the fibers to be a spurt, think on the fibers to be transected, especially in tumor related epilepsy. Choose the best approach in your hands, always in your hands. And if you don't feel confident with a case, refer it to someone who can do it better. I do it routinely and I feel very well because this is the best for our patients. Let me finish with this. This is a fish with a very thick anterior commissure, two neopalial guys, neocortical guys are trying to hunt it, but uh, he can uh, get rid of them thanks to the anterior commissure and to his rhinencephalum. And this is a fully neocortical guy which wants to get some money illegally from the bank, but he lost his gun and always the anterior commissure is there to save his life. So that's all. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it and I'm open to any comment. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. That's a wonderful talk. And uh, even it's tempting for someone like me to take up epilepsy surgery, such a clarity of uh, 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 topic and I would like to ask one of our uh, panelists to comment and, and ask some questions on Pablo's talk and Roy and Professor Schoss I can see on the screen and Professor Uga Ture. Um, any comments or talk? Or any any anything to clarify? Yeah, I go. Yeah, hello Pablo. Thank you very much. It's very nice to see you. A splendid lecture, as always. You have a, this is a special way of bringing anatomy to the uh, to the award. Uh, could you please comment on the on the definition? Because as I understood well, uh, you don't include uh, cingulate gyros when you say uh, limbic lobe. So uh, I was a little confused. Please comment this on is, that. No, uh, thank you, Igor. This is coming from a Professor Yasser Kiel's book. Uh, and uh, I, I, I do agree that the uh, cingulate is indeed the, the main core of the limbic lobe. But uh, attending to the um, organization of the neurons on the, on the cingulate, it belongs uh, to a more uh, evolution uh, area. But yes, it's part of the limbic. Although in that text, it was uh, classified as the paralimbic structure. Yeah, uh, I think there is a, a difference to be done then uh, between the limbic cortex and the big lobe. Yeah, yeah, That's you're right. Question. Thank you, Igor. Thank you, Igor. Um, Prof. Giovanni? Yes. Uh, um, well, compliments for this wonderful presentation. I think that you stress one point, very important. Also, in, uh, in uh, tumor resection, the uh, uh, intraoperative uh, corticography uh, is very, very important. I think that if you lose 10 minutes to do it, it's, uh, it's more safe for the patient. So thank you for underlining this uh, particular neurophysiologic aspect. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank, Thank you. you. I Roy, agree with you. Can you say something, Roy? Unmute yourself and can you unmute uh, Roy? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Pablo, for an excellent talk. And uh, I have no uh, questions to you. It's uh, really clear, and how you bring it to life is uh, 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 is remarkable. And uh, I, I think the main uh, message of your talk. Uh, uh, which young people should realize is uh, there's nothing more important than, uh, than anatomy. And in this case, physiology as uh, with respect to the epileptiform activity, with respect to tumor surgery. There's a lot of emphasis in the last few decades on image, images and uh, augmented reality and image guided surgery. But uh, I, I think we should stay with our roots of anatomy and physiology to do this kind of surgery in uh, in the best way possible. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, Pablo, that was a really enjoyable talk. Quick question. 
you know, the goal of the surgery and a lot of these low grade tumors that present with seizures is not just to take out the tumor, but to stop the epilepsy. And there were some cases you showed that had infiltration of it, just the head of the hippocampus or the amygdala. Uh, in many of those cases, particularly on the non-dominant side, I would have recommended removing the entire hippocampus uh, because that residual hippocampal tail can be epileptogenic on its own. Have you followed a lot of those patients after just doing lesionectomies, leaving part of the hippocampus behind to see if they're indeed seizure free? And why did you choose to just do a lesionectomy there and not remove the whole hippocampus? Thank you. And uh, I was almost sure that uh, this, this point would come to the, to the discussion. And I, I fully agree with you. I don't have a long experience. I, I started my practice only eight, nine years ago, but I have seen some of these patients with, with uh, which in which we tried to remove the anti-epileptic drugs and we couldn't do that probably because we were not uh, 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 quite aggressive removing the hippocampus and the, the main uh, uh, reason why I am not doing that is because I'm limited by my approaches if I do that uh, probably I will start damaging some other fibers and it's some point a matter of uh, not having enough space in order to reach the posterior aspect of the hippocampus safely with a transylvian approach or an anterior polectomy because I'm scared of damaging the IFO or the optic radiations. So that's why in most of these cases, I, I, I was not able to reach the posterior aspect of the hippocampus. That's why, but I fully agree and I appreciate your comment. Yeah, because the goal of course is to stop their seizures. And if they still have seizures afterwards, some people would trade a little quadrant defect in their vision for seizure freedom. Thank you. I think that's that's great talk and uh, great comments from the panelists. And uh, thank you, Pablo. Um, I would like to now invite, and it's my pleasure and honor to invite Professor Theodore Schwartz um, from Will Connell and Presbyterian Hospital in New York, um, Professor of Neurosurgery and also Professor of Minimally Invasive Surgery, which is a field which I'm interested in as well. And um, also Director of uh, Neuro Oncology and Epilepsy and Pituitary Surgery. And, uh, invite you to talk on the latest update on the later, later interstitial thermal therapy for epilepsy. Please, uh, Dr. Professor Schwartz. Yeah, are uh, you muted? Can you unmute yourself? Uh, you're muted now. Um, can you unmute yourself? I think it's, can you see me now? Yeah, 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 go on. Yeah, we can hear you now. I, that was a silly mistake. So you guys can see my slides? Yes. All right, let me just, for some reason, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna change gears a little bit because you know the idea of using laser interstitial th uh, thermal therapy sort of moves away from the concept that a lot of neurosurgeons pride ourselves on, which is our ability to do very careful meticulous dissections and show off our surgical skills. And LIT really resides on the idea that the source of seizures in certain patients is just the amygdala and hippocampus. And if you think about it, risking uh, splitting the sylvian fissure as elegant as that is, or risking uh, the a temporal pole resection really doesn't make sense if you're trying to just remove the amygdala and hippocampus, and maybe we can leverage some new technology to try to get that job done. So these are just some of my disclosures. Just a little bit about epilepsy. As we all know, uh, there are areas in the brain where there's an imbalance between excitation and inhibition. There's a lot of different reasons why this can happen, um, but we have to keep in mind that although we treat patients with epilepsy with medications first and foremost, we do rely on surgery. It's really the only cure for some of these patients with intractable epilepsy. And again, these are not patients necessarily that have tumors, but have uh, some of the more standard definitions of epilepsy that are based on mesial temporal sclerosis and hypothalamic hamartomas and things such as that. And surgery, as we know, is safe, it's effective. And even if you can't cure a patient, you can often palliate them. When do we operate? Well, you know, unlike with a tumor, when we know the tumor is going to grow, we have to make a decision when we're going to operate on a relatively normal looking brain. And that's when the medications fail or they have intolerable side effects. And when the chance of curing the patient is very high, even if they're only having infrequent seizures. Mortality and morbidity are fairly low. These are just the risks of standard 
uh, temporal lobectomy, about a less than 2% risk of any sort of permanent morbidity, probably less than that uh, 5% for temporary and permanent. And we see things like infections, hemorrhages, cranial nerve palsies, uh, but we also have to bear in mind, and this is very important, that there is a risk of not doing surgery. There's a risk of sudden unexpected death, what we call SUDEP, in these patients with uncontrolled epilepsy, status epilepticus, things like that. And it makes the risks of surgery more palatable in the mind of the patient when they understand that there's a risk of not doing surgery. Because a lot of these patients have been living with their disease forever and they can live with it for a very long period of time. Uh, there's also negative effects of the, of the medications. So there's uh, def many different ways to classify seizures. And this is sort of a, a simplified surgeon's view, but we think about seizures as these either starting in one place in the brain or starting uh, in a lot of different places and being more generalized. And what we're talking about with lit and with focal surgery are these partial or focal onset seizures that start in one place in the brain. And they're partial when they don't, when they're simple or partial, uh, simple when they don't involve consciousness and complex when they involve consciousness, such as uh, mesial temporal epilepsy. Also, sure, just one second. Could you want to make it a full slide? I think we are seeing it. Uh, uh... Yeah, I will absolutely. I'm not sure how to, you know, uh, I could just stop this. This is my presentation mode. Yes, um, we could all see your next slide as well on the screen. Uh, oh, yeah. I don't know why that is. Yeah, this is, this is, yeah, I mean, you could figure out at the bottom um, and, you know, you can see, yeah. That's leave it like this. If that's better, how's that? Um, still not on this slide. Ah, yeah, this, is, this is probably slide more. You could maybe maximize the whole window. Let's see if I can move this over. Ah, how's that? Um, this, this was the yeah. Well, this is better. We don't see your next slide anymore. Yeah, it's sort of odd because this is the slideshow presentation that they give you in. Um, um, well, yeah. Flemish, but we are able to see the the lines and read the lines, and I think, I think this is now, better than the first time. So we don't see your next slide. So you can carry on if that's okay. Okay. Yeah. I apologize. For that. Um, so, so, the goal of um, uh, well, let's talk a little bit about mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. That's the indication for which we use lit the most. These are patients with complex partial seizures. They have automatisms, they sort of space out for a little bit, they often have auras. A lot of these patients have febrile seizures when they're young. You see high signal and atrophy on MRI in the hippocampus in some of these patients, but not all of these patients. You can see hypometabolism on PET scans, and we can cure about 70 to 80% of these patients. And this just shows you some of that hippocampal atrophy associated with mesial temporal sclerosis here on the right side. With open surgery, uh, we can obviously resect the amygdala and hippocampus, we can get all those areas out, but there is some adjacent cortical damage that occurs. And there may be some effects of taking out the temporal pole or dissecting through the sylvian fissure uh, and resecting some of the white matter that doesn't need to be resected. Uh, the classic study that was done, uh, one of the few randomized prospective surgical trials in epilepsy out of Canada, where they randomized patients 40 to a year of medical versus surgical therapy, it was an intention to treat analysis. It was randomized before they got their video EG and WADA, which means that some of the patients randomized to surgery never actually got surgery. So 10% of our patients in the surgery group never got it. And resections were very variable. They were not standardized. So that did undermine the results a little bit, but nevertheless, there was a dramatically significantly uh, significant improvement in seizure control up to 58% in one year versus 8% in the medical group, showing the efficacy of surgery uh, in treating mesial temporal sclerosis. So let's talk about laser interstitial thermal therapy. We stereotactically place a fiber optic catheter. We can control our thermal injury by heating the surrounding tissues. We can do real time MR thermography to monitor the temperature and the size of the ablation that we're making in real time. So there is some feedback. It's not a completely blind procedure. And the thermal injury damages intracellular proteins, damages DNA and leads to cell death or apoptosis. And we do get a fairly sharp demarcation between our ablated tissue and our unharmed tissue. The temperature is very important. The higher the temperature, the more damage you do. Uh, below a certain temperature, you won't do any damage. And at a particular temperature, there will be time-dependent thermal damage. So if you leave it on long enough, you get damage. And if you turn it off, there is no damage. So these procedures can be done very differently. It can be done awake, asleep. 
Uh, procedures can be of different uh, lengths. Uh, you can place catheters in different locations. Uh, you can use a frame, you can do it frameless, you can do it in the intraoperative MRI, you can do it in the OR and bring them down to the MR suite. It all really depends on Procedure. your Procedure. A surgeon uses computer software to identify the target tissue. So this is a video uh, that uh, was made uh, by a company, uh, and it's a really nice demonstration of how things are done. So you put the stereotactic head frame on, you can drill a very, very small hole, uh, and then advance what's called a bolt, uh, and screw a small bolt into the cranium so it uh, gets good purchase in the skull. Uh, and then that defines your trajectory. And then you can take this patient down to the MRI or you can put the catheter in in the operating room. Uh, but here's the, uh, this is one of the devices called the visualize. The catheter gets placed into the uh, area of interest. And then the patient is brought down to MRI scan and down an MRI scan, we have a control, uh, computer control panel where we can step on a foot pedal and start up the laser. It's really an on or off type of thing. You can't do different uh, degrees of laser on and off. And then you can move the laser. So you can create a lesion that's roughly uh, either a circle or an oval. Uh, but you- And damage zone estimates in real time. Just move on. So this is one of the uh, technologies called the visual laser. It's made by Medtronic. Uh, and that makes a ellipsoid or circular uh, lesion, but you have a limited diameter, right? It only goes about a centimeter in each direction. So you can make a two centimeter lesion roughly. So this just shows you an example of what that looks like, what the MR thermography looks like. And on the bottom, you can actually see the ablated hippocampus as the uh, catheter is pulled back. So it's very important that you put it in the right trajectory because you're limited by your trajectory as to how much of the hippocampus you can remove and ablate because the hippocampus is not shaped like a cylinder, right? It curves around the brainstem. It curves in multiple different axes. So you have to be very, very thoughtful about how you place that catheter to maximize your ablation. The other device we have is made by Monteris called the Neuroblade. It has a little bit more flexibility uh, in a couple of ways. It has this tip firing catheter, but it also has a side firing catheter that allows you to shoot from the side and then rotate using a robot and withdraw so that you can contour the size uh, and shape of the lesion you make. And I prefer that a little bit because it gives you a little more flexibility. It's not just uh, a, a, an oval, but you can actually contour it. And there's also coolant that flows through all this because it gets pretty, pretty hot. So what you see with the Monteras is a blue zone that's sort of the dead zone and a yellow zone where there's not yet thermal damage, but you will get to thermal damage if you leave it on long enough so you can sort of anticipate where you're gonna go. So we use this for gliomas, for METs, for radiation necrosis, um, but we also use it for epilepsy and mainly mesial temporal sclerosis, hammer, hypothalamic hammertomas, cortical dysplasia, corpus callosotomy. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, some of the questions that we have about LIT is, does it work as well with a normal MRI versus mesial temporal sclerosis? We'll talk about that. What does it do to verbal memory? Uh, uh, if you use cortical, dis if you're operating on cortical dysplasia, the use of stereo EEG to identify the areas of interest. Um, and with corpus callosotomy, you need several trajectories to do an effective corpus callosotomy. So this is a patient with mesial temporal sclerosis. You can see the right hippocampus is smaller. They have temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, we like to do these where we place the catheter in the operating room. We don't have an intraoperative MRI. Um, and then we bring the patient down to the operating room suite. This just shows you the trajectory we chose to maximize our hippocampal ablation. And these are the images you get when you're in the MRI uh, suite, just confirming the location of the catheter. And then we make the lesion and we pull back the catheter. And so if you imagine you're really just trying to ablate the hippocampus, this is about as focal as you can get, uh, you know, and you can see why some surgeons prefer doing this over doing open surgery. Uh, this just shows you the thermography that actually shows you in real time the temperature that you're achieving uh, in different uh, areas. So this was a study came out a couple of years ago, 234 patients from 11 centers. Uh, and one thing they found that the ablations that were more anterior, medial, and inferior, actually more in the amygdala, tend to have a better class one outcome. I'll show you that data. But that was the first data showing us sort of where we want to do these lesions to get the best outcome. And they reported that after one to two years, 
58% got an angle one outcome, which was actually quite good and very competitive with open surgeries. But I'm gonna go into that in a little more detail. Um, having hippocampal sclerosis in this study did not make a difference as to outcome, but that also is somewhat controversial. Uh, and I'll show you a bit of their uh, location data. So they used this uh, color-coded map, which is pretty interesting, looking at where they ablated and what seizure outcome was like. And what they found was that the more anterior medial ablations in volume had better seizure outcomes. So the red zone is the key zone. So it was less the hippocampus than it was the amygdala, sorry, less the tail of the hippocampus than it was the amygdala and the head of the hippocampus. So your favorable location was in green, which puts your trajectory a little bit more lateral in order to get more medial and unfavorable was in red. So, uh, you know, the more lateral you were, obviously you're gonna get more damage to the optic radiations as well and hippocampal tail versus more medial, which will be amygdala, hippocampal head, and less optic radiations. So I'm gonna review a couple of studies that have gone over the results. Um, this is a study that showed a seizure free rate of about 58% for all patients. And if you had MTS, it was actually better, it was 66%. And that makes sense because you imagine you have a normal MRI scan, there's less of a guarantee that your seizures are coming from the mesial temporal structures that could be coming from the neocortex. But the complication rates are not as low as you'd think. The overall complication rate was about 17% and permanent complication rate was 5%. So I don't tell my uh, patients that lit is any safer than doing open surgery because my open surgery complications are roughly the same or potentially even better. This is another larger study. I like this one because it looks at, uh, it highlights the difference between those who had MTS and those who didn't. Now, as you see, these numbers are small. They have 19 MTS patients, only seven without MTS. And they said there was no statistically significant difference between those results, but their seizure control rates for patients who did not have mesial temporal sclerosis was only 43%. And the reason it wasn't significant was because their numbers were so low, but those results are really not so great. Uh, here was another paper that came out recently, which uh, is eye-opening. And it shows that your overall seizure freedom from lit, if you look at one year and then compare it to two year, the numbers really go down quite a bit. And after two years, their numbers went from above 50% to below 50%, uh, just over 40%. So it may be that the efficacy of lit over a long period of time, which we don't really have enough data to prove definitively may actually be less than doing open surgery. You do get cranial neuropathies. Uh, you can put a lot of heat on cranial nerve three and cranial nerve four. Uh, and so, you know, these patients need to know that they can get those same complications. We think of CSF and blood as a shunt for the heat. And we know that the ambient cistern is carrying CSF and, and uh, the, the, the PCOM. Um, but those cranial nerves can be damaged with lit if you're too close to them. Uh, this uh, was another interesting paper showing that if you do stereo EG, if you do an implant, then the difference between patients with and without MTS is about the same. And so you can take from this paper that maybe if you're going to think about lit in a patient who does not have mesial temporal sclerosis, maybe you should implant that patient first to confirm that their onsets are mesial before you move to doing a uh, focal ablation like lit. Complication rates about 15%, very comparable. Uh, you can get hemorrhages, uh, you can get visual field defects uh, that are about the same, 50. Uh, in, so in this first paper, I'm gonna show you, they reported only a 5% rate of visual complications. But if you look at some other uh, papers, those numbers go up. In this paper, they had a 37.5% rate of visual field defect after lit, um, higher with left than right, which doesn't really make sense. Um, and they said that the, the visual field defect is a little smaller. It's an octantinopsia instead of a quadrant tenopsia. But obviously, even with open surgery, depending on how aggressive you are, you don't have to get a quadrant every time. Um, and in this paper, they found that 67% of patients getting lit had visual field changes. So this is a moving uh, target here. And I think the important point is that lit really is not any safer than open surgery it just uh, is a little bit faster, gets, maybe gets patients out of the hospital a little quicker, uh, but that's important in, in talking to our patients. Um, this was another one looking at with and without MTS, um, showing that the results with MTS were higher than those without MTS, but also showed 
that in patients with lit, the idea is that in the dominant hemisphere, you get less verbal memory deficits. Uh, and they did find that there still is a verbal memory deficit if you do lit on the dominant side, um, but there was not in naming, so it may be somewhat preserved. But again, this data is very early, it's new, it hasn't been reproduced. Uh, we don't have any comparative data. Uh, for example, this paper said that, well, MTS is not important, uh, but in fact, the only patients who had no MTS and no stereo EEG, there were only two patients in that group. Only two patients. You really can't make any conclusions from two patients. Uh, and in my opinion, if you're going to do a lit and you have a normal MRI scan you, uh, and you're looking uh, at a non-lesional case, you probably should do stereo EEG and figure that out. This shows you one of the cases uh, we did looking at target planning and moving the electrode with the Monteris. Uh, this is done robotically. So once you place the uh, probe, you can pull it back uh, slowly and carefully. And you've got the blue area showing you what you've ablated with the side firing uh, laser. Uh, and this is just a video of that treatment being done sped up in time. We make our first ablation. We go and look from yellow, which is sort of a prediction of where the blue will be, and then the blue, and then we pull it back a little bit and we extend that lesion more posteriorly. Uh, and then we can pull it back yet again uh, to go and get a little bit more of the hippocampal tail. Uh, but as I mentioned before, it seems like the anterior section is the most important. But this gives you sort of a view of what it looks like in surgery. This is the lit surgeon's equivalent of looking through the microscope or the endoscope, endoscope and showing you a movie of what it is like for the viewer to do the procedure. Uh, and this is the post-op uh, contour of the area of ablation. And then this shows you the MRI scan done in the scanner uh, where they can give some contrast. You can actually see the ablation volume at the time when you do it. And it looks a bit like a cigar. Uh, what about hypothalamic hamartomas? Uh, you know, these are uh, very difficult to get to. Uh, you know, if you, people used to do corpus callosotomies and split the fornices to get down there, but you can put a lit probe right in there uh, and uh, blate the uh, hypothalamic hamartoma. Length of stay is one night. Uh, in this uh, series, 80% had gelastic epilepsy, which are seizures where you laugh, which is classic for hypothalamic hamartomas. Uh, and 56% of patients with non-gelastic seizures, 80% of patients with gelastic seizures were seizure-free, uh, but there was a 39% uh, complication rate, right? So it still is pretty high. One case of hemiparis is probably safer than doing open surgery overall. 22% had persistent deficits, um, things like hypothyroidism, short-term memory loss, weight gain, hypothalamic injury, uh, but those are probably comparable to open surgery. This just shows you an example of doing lit for a hypothalamic hamartoma. You can see how minimally invasive uh, that is compared to an open surgical procedure. You can also disconnect uh, by making a focal ablation. If you have a big hypothalamic hematoma like this, you can try to just ablate its uh, pedicle. Um, it can be used in cavernous malformations. I've not done it. I'm not such a huge fan. I'm not convinced that it's the best way to treat cavernous malformations associated with seizures, but there are reports of it. It's important to know that. Um, I do worry about causing a hemorrhage when you put your lit uh, probe right into a cavernous malformation. Um, you can use it for insular epilepsy, where you can make uh, multiple uh, passes uh, to get into the insula. So that's something to keep in mind, still very experimental. And then corpus callosotomy is a, is a great uh, other approach uh, for this. Um, patients, we know, you know, we do corpus callosotomy for patients with frequent atonic seizures or drop attacks to disconnection uh, procedures. Uh, it also works for some generalized tonic-clonic seizures, atypical absence and tonic seizures as well. Uh, these are patients who have generalized interictal and ictal events, multifocal, no focal epilepsy, uh, and secondary bisynchrony on their EEG. We had published very early on a proof of principle, uh, and this was just done essentially using the brain lab software and saying, hey, how much of the hippocampus can we remove with different trajectories and approaches and we figured we could do a complete callosotomy with two approaches, uh, one from the front and one from behind going in either direction. Um, just showing you those uh, trajectories and sites. Uh, this was a paper written by Dr. Um, Ash Mehta, who had been a resident here. He's done some great work in epilepsy in his career. Um, and he did some really interesting stuff um, showing, and these are five patients who had lit callosotomy. And he would do you know, interoperative uh, electrical recordings during surgery 
and EEG recording showing how the disconnection really uh, would immediately change that uh, right after callosotomy. He also went on to show that after the callosotomy, some patients then had focal epilepsy and could go back and he would do a resection of the, the focus that was then revealed after disconnecting, because uh, once the, the seizures don't spread as quickly, you can sometimes find that focus and remove it. This was a more uh, recent uh, paper on corpus callosotomy. On the left is a single fiber, single tract. These are patients who don't have a complete corpus callosum or have a partially ablated corpus callosum where you're just ablating part of it. And on the right is a dual uh, track, again, from one from behind and one from the front and the side uh, to get the front and to get the genu to do an anterior uh, two thirds uh, callosotomy. And again, you know, it, be, it becomes an issue of how many passes you want to place, how many catheters you want to place, and when does this uh, length of surgery become longer than just doing it uh, open. The frequency of lit is increasing over time. More and more of these procedures are being done. It is part of what the neurosurgeons in epilepsy need to know how to do. Uh, and the big questions are when uh, to do it. So I wanted to kind of put it all together and tell you what my thinking is about LIT right now. Uh, I, and that is that LIT is a reasonable alternative to open surgery for temporal lobe epilepsy for sure. The long-term seizure outcomes are probably not as good. The reason being that epilepsy is a network disease. It's not just a focus. It's not just a single place that's abnormal. And we like to think that it's just in one area but the fact that in open surgery, we tend to resect a little more tissue. We tend to take the entorhinal cortex, the parahippocampal gyrus, the temporal tip. We're probably disconnecting the area for, of, of interest from other areas. And so we probably get better long-term seizure outcome when we do open surgery than when we do lit. But lit is pretty good. The complication rates are about the same. It's possible that there's better cognitive outcome because there's no damage to the neocortex. Uh, and that has yet to be fully validated. So in my practice, what I like to do is on the dominant side, in a patient with MTS, I will offer them lit and say, we should probably do this first because of the cognitive benefits and the very good seizure control. If it's the dominant side with a normal MRI scan, I'll recommend an implant first because I don't want to lit the dominant hippocampus. And I'm not sort of putting all the WADA information into here other than say dominant, non-dominant. Um, but if it ends up being mesial, then I will offer them lit. If it's non-dominant, I offer them open surgery first because the long-term seizure control rates are better and the cognitive impact of, the, of an open surgery is really not different than LIT as far as I can tell and the literature has showed. And so I wanna get better seizure outcome. Uh, if they're non-dominant with a normal MRI, I tend to do an implant first before going to open surgery. But obviously if these patients refuse open surgery, it's better they get LIT than they get nothing. So we do non-dominant LIT as well based on patient's preference, as long as they understand the long-term seizure control rate is not as good. Location is important. I try to go more anterior. Uh, minimal, minimal volume is also important. More is better. I do think hypothalamic hamartomas are better treated with lip and open surgery. Uh, I try to avoid gamma knife if I can get away with it, uh, just because it is uh, radiation. And for corpus callosotomy, a complete callosotomy is probably easier to do uh, open because you have just have more access. But for anterior two thirds, I think lit is reasonable because you don't have to make multiple passes. You could probably do it in two passes. Thank you very much. And I'm open to questions. Thank you, Professor Shorts. I think I'll ask uh, Professor Matkanan to say something about this uh, new technique. Well, uh, first I'd like to thank uh, Professor Schwartz for accepting our invitation. And uh, I enjoyed the talks very much. It's very well balanced. It's, uh, I like when people introduce a new technology. It's not only for the sake of making popular, but giving a sound uh, clinical judgment, and you did it very well. I have one question for you. Uh, it looks like that procedure is more uh, uh, image-guided procedure rather than a neurophysiology or electrophysiology guided. And this is where sometimes in the open surgery we refuse to. So what is your take on this one? Well, you know, we have uh, probably a half a century of knowledge about MT, mesial temporal sclerosis and where those seizures are coming from and how those patients do. So I think in terms of patient selection, uh, all epilepsy is a combination of electrophysiology and image guidance and knowledge. We can never, no matter how many electrodes we implant, we can never sample the entire brain. So I think in patients with MTS and clear MTS and, and when everything else lines up, 
doing a lip procedure is, is reasonable in those patients. But if you have a normal MRI scan, you, I think you need to rely, you, you then can't rely on your imaging, right? Because your MRI scan is normal. And that's where you have to depend more on your electrophysiology because the PET scans, although helpful, are not completely definitive. And the WADA test, while helpful, is also not completely definitive. It's showing you where the seizures are coming from. So I try to take that type of a balanced approach. I'm just thinking, referring to the case uh, Pablo showed, they were he resected and he felt is well with the resection based on images, but when the, the neurophysiology showed him that there's still spike coming, so he resected further and he could control the seizure and stop. Uh, these are the cases where I feel this is where uh, electrophysiology become an essential during the open surgery. That's yeah, the reason. That's not, that was that. not mesial temporal sclerosis. You're talking about a tumor. About tumor, irritating, yeah. Yeah, irritating adjacent neocortex. Nobody would recommend laser therapy for that type of a case. So I agree but with you. But you talk about the hamartomas uh, as well. Yeah, it would be mostly for deep hamartomas. If you're doing cortical dysplasia that's near the ventricle, I wouldn't use, I don't like to use lit for the surface of the brain because yeah. you're right near all the blood vessels of the pia. You know, these are for deep lesions, which is why I talked about uh, uh, hamartomas, for example. No one's doing electrocorticography in a hamartoma. You can put a stereo EEG, but you're not recording from the hypothalamus around the hamartoma oh. with multiple electrodes. You really can't do that. So it's different than neocortical epilepsy. We're not talking about a neocortical epileptic focus. Thank you. Um, um, Roy, you want to comment? Uh, oh, oh. Uh, can you unmute? Oh, you're muted. Thank you, Professor Schwartz, for this excellent talk. Uh, we've also uh, been doing a few lit out here in Lausanne. And one of the things that we've noted is that, I mean, as you clearly said, it's the limitation of being in the trajectory of that electrode. So uh, almost always we do it with uh, SEG. But we've had to go in for open surgery for some cases, but otherwise the early results are pretty good. But thank you for your excellent demonstration and the review of the literature. Thank you. you any other comment? Um, okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much for coming coming to present this topic and uh, coming to the WFNS Anatomy Committee. Thank you. thank you so much for inviting me. It was really a pleasure to be here. Good. Well, um, thank you. I'll look, and now hand over to Professor Baldocini and uh, Professor Maldonado to carry on with the session. Um, Matthias, you want to take, start off the next? Yes. Well, continuing this second day of our 10th webinar, um, it's a huge pleasure to present uh, from, from Istanbul, from Turkey, um, to Professor Ugul Ture with a special topic related with a selective amygdala compectomy and a special topic. Thank you, Professor Ugul Ture. Uh, for being here, sharing your knowledge uh, with everybody. So I hope you can see my slide now, huh? <laughs> Thank yes, you. we can see perfectly. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for any trouble. Uh, dear Professor Baldoncini and Maldonado and Benes and Imad uh, and Nair, thank you for your kind invitation. It's been a great pleasure for me to join you in this special uh, webinar and to share uh, my uh, experience. And I'm very happy to be here with such a distinguished uh, faculty, especially Pablo Gonzalez Lopez. I'm very proud of him, uh, what he is doing. and. Uh, I really enjoy. Uh, I really enjoy his talk, and uh, I'm very happy to meet with him. Uh, my talk about the uh, selective amygdala hippocampectomy for mediobasal uh, temporal uh, epilepsy. Uh, first of all, I like to mention 
instead of using mesial, I prefer to use medial, mediobasal temporal. I think the mesial, the term of mesial is wrong to use here because mesial means the inner side of the teeth. So no relation with the hippocampus or uh, limbic lobe. So the correct term has to be a mediobasal uh, temporal region. Uh, just to clarify the terminology. The epilepsy, I don't want to talk too much with the history, but the epilepsy is the very uh, old, uh, there are many information about epilepsy in the history. The one of the first one is uh, from uh, almost uh, 4,000 years ago from the uh, code of Hammurabi. In the code of Hammurabi, he mentioned that uh, the a slave just bought to appearing to suffer from the epilepsy attack can be returned to the seller. So you cannot sell um, epileptic uh, slave <laughs> in the Hammurabi code. And also the one of the first earliest recorded uh, tablets also in Babylon, uh, Babylonian period. But of course they mentioned that this epilepsy is, uh, has a supernatural origin related to moon goddess or Ishtar or Yana or of course they thought that this is uh, related to uh, God. Of course, the first time the Hippocrates uh, mentioned that the epilepsy is a natural disease and it's coming from brain. This is very important uh, development on the history of uh, medicine, of course. And then this is interesting picture. This is from 12th century uh, from, it is British Museum. The epilepticus sic curibatur, the way to cure epilepsy. This is the first intraoperative uh, drawing <laughs> of epilepsy surgery. And they were uh, curing epilepsy with trepanation and uh, cauterization. Just 200 years later, uh, also Turkish uh, physician, Şerafettin Sabuncuoğlu, uh, in his book, uh, draw also the surgical technique uh, for uh, curing epilepsy. This is, I think, the second uh, drawing about the epilepsy surgery. Of course, without mentioning Horsley in uh, London, we cannot talk about epilepsy. He, is, he, he did the first epilepsy surgery with Jackson. Of course, Krause from Germany, Forster from Germany, they were the first epilepsy surgeons. And then, of course, Penfield from Canada described the temporal lobectomy for temporal epilepsy surgery, which temporal lobectomy is still the one of the most common surgical technique for treatment of uh, mediobasal temporal epilepsy. And it is one of the most successful surgery also. And he described to remove the uh, two thirds of the temporal lobe and then with the also hippocampus and amygdala. It must be difficult without my hippocampus and amygdala, of course. We are coming to selective amygdala hippocampectomy because the, the, with the electrophysiologist studies, the the tem most of the temp uh, mediobasal temporal uh, epilepsies originates from amygdala and hippocampus. So the great idea came from Niemeyer, from Brazil, that why we are taking whole temporal lobe, if the problem is in the amygdala and hippocampus, why we are taking whole temporal lobe? So we have to take out the hippocampus and amygdala selectively. Imagine without microscope, he described this approach in 1958 through go through the uh, middle temporal gyrus to reach the ventricle and then to remove the amygdala and hippocampus. And this was the great uh, development of uh, in epilepsy surgery. And then 1982, Professor Yashargil, my mentor, described selective amygdala hippocampectomy 
via pterenal, pterenal transylvian approach. He got this idea uh, when he removed the craniopharyngioma or other tumors, and he, he, he when opened the sylvian fissure, he find out that amygdala is front of him and hippocampus is just there. Why not to take out? Originally, as you know, he, he was not an epilepsy surgeon. He was a vascular surgeon and tumor surgeon. And then in his department, there were epilepsy surgeons. Uh, but he was doing temporal lobectomy. So he got the idea to remove the only amygdala in hippocampus via Transylvian approach, because he was using Transylvian approach for almost every day. And he described this approach in 1982, which one of the uh, topic I will I, I would like to uh, talk about. The key point is the opening the Sylvia fissure very well, and then through the uh, inferior peninsular sulcus, you can reach the ventricle. Of course, this artistic drawing exaggerates the anatomy, but uh, normally in the surgery, uh, only surgeon can see something because we are working in very small area. But the drawing uh, described better. So to get the vascularization of the hippocampus, the understanding of the vascularization of the hippocampus and amygdala and the surrounding uh, neural structure is the key point, of course. And in the anterior part, the amygdala is removed, and then he removed the hippocampus uh, post uh, after amygdala. So the opening of the sylvian fissure is the key in the success of this approach without damaging neocortical structures, including temporal pole. And then first removal of amygdala and uncus, and then opening the PIA and identification of the internal carotid, posterior communicating, anterior choroidal, posterior cerebral artery, basal vein, third nerve, optic tract. These are the, because the hippocampus is itself is not eloquent structure, but the, 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 everything is around the hippocampus is totally eloquent. So it's more difficult to get there. And then opening the choroidal fissure through the tenia fimbria, between fimbria and choroid plexus. And then the transverse section of the, uh, through the tail of the hippocampus. And then lateral in the uh, hippocampus uh, through the collateral eminence. These are the, his descriptions. And it's beautifully illustrated and it is, very nice surgery, very well uh, described surgery. Uh, he used this for selective uh, amygdala hippocampectomy. No, there are still discussion that, you know, the with temporal lobectomy, we have the same uh, seizure control. Why we are struggling to remove amygdala and hippocampus uh, in very difficult surgery. You know, the selective amygdala hippocampectomy is not an easy surgery. But still, many people, many experts also describe another techniques for selective amygdala hippocampectomy also in the same time. Uh, Professor Spencer, 84, he described uh, to uh, anterolateral resection to get the uh, hippocampus and amygdala. It's also another beautiful technique. And then Dr. Kelly described magnetic resonance imaging based computer assisted stereotactic resection. Uh, interesting, Dr. Shimizu, this is also a good idea to cut the zygoma and then to get the uh, mediobasal temporal region. So these are another techniques that how we can get the uh, mediobasal temporal region because the, with the development of the neurophysiological studies and development with MRI, now we have better uh, indications for selective hippocampectomy. This is another technique. And then Dr. Hori described subtemporal amygdala hippocampectomy. And then uh, Dr. Park also. But of course, these are not pure selective. Actually, Transylvian is also not pure se trans uh, selective because you have to take a little uh, the anterior part. And then 
Interestingly, gamma knife surgery also uh, described for the uh, as a selective hippocampectomy. Uh, and then inferior temporal sulcus approaches another way. And then laser amygdala hippocampectomy also described for uh, this uh, selective uh, technique. And Dr. Schwartz shows also beautifully that this is also another uh, option. Finally, th this is left side of the hemispheres. I can summarize that. Uh, many people try to describe the best technique to get the selective removal of the amygdala in hippocampus. Anterior one, Professor Yashagil described Transylvian approach and Dr. Spencer described anterolateral temporal approach. They both are anterior view to get the hippocampus and amygdala. And then lateral approaches, it can be lateral transcortical, uh, it can be through the superior temporal sulcus or middle temporal gyrus or inferior temporal sulcus. These are similar approaches, uh, but it is lateral transcortical approaches. Subtemporal approaches, Dr. Hori described subtem, but you have to remove the inferior temporal gyrus and spudiform gyrus also. And uh, also Dr. Park described transparahippocampal, he just retract. And then zygomatic also, you have to remove the inferior temporal and the fusiform gyrus to get that. But overall, the approaches can be anterior or lateral. I personally, you know, the Professor Yashagil is my mentor and I, my teacher, and I learned Transylvian approach. And I prefer to use Transylvian approach. Also, I work in the laboratory and I find that this is the less invasive approach. Surgical approach is not easy, you know, as I told you with the mediobasal temporal region, because the as I, the hippocampus itself is not eloquent, but the surrounding structures are totally eloquent, the intervascular structures and the neural structures. And there are danger uh, for neurological deficit. So you can find here many uh, neural structures and vascular structures. If you want to deal with the hippocampus and amygdala, you have to deal with them and you have to keep in your mind. The point is, you know, we don't know still the, how much temporal lobe we have to remove, or we don't know still the functional aspects and neural connections of the temporal lobe. And so the goal should be the, we have to, uh, the, our, in our procedure depends on reduction of the amount of damage inflicted. We have to, find the real target and we have to damage only this and not surrounding structures because we don't know the exact uh, functional uh, network and we cannot monitor. If you say that you, the so solution is awake surgery, no. Because especially the non-dominant temporal lobe, the sexual function, how you can monitor sexual function? or other detailed limbic uh, functions and characters or whatever. So my goal is the, if you find the real uh, sclerosis and clear sclerosis in the three Tesla MRI and the all other data shows that this is the clear case, I prefer selective hippocampectomy and I have better results. And it looks like, you know, if you have a problem in your finger, to cut the arm is not fair. So we have to find that we have to be sure, of course, the finger is the problem and we have to cut the finger. For this, I work a lot in the lab to understand this surrounding anatomy. First of all, this white matter of the temporal lobe, we have to keep in our mind. I put in, in 10 groups and eight of them we have to preserve in even in the epilepsy surgery. We have to go only alveus, fimbria, and fornix 
an inferior arm of the cingulum within the parahippocampal gyrus to get the real selective amygdala hippocampectomy. Otherwise, we can damage all structures that just I like to summarize it here. First of all, the, of course, the cortex, neocortex. Neocortex uh, damage in the neocortex may create another target, another uh, reason for the uh, epilepsy also. Uh, short association fibers, U fibers, and then superior longitudinal fasciculus, inferior arm of superior longitudinal fasciculus, and then uncinate fasciculus, and then occipitofrontal fasciculus. And then, of course, anterior commissure. These are the all uh, the white matter structures in the uh, temporal lobe. And then sublenticular part of the internal capsule, temporopontine fibers and occipitopontine fibers. And another sublenticular part of the internal capsule, inferior thalamic peduncle, and then posterior thalamic peduncle. Posterior uh, thalamic peduncle includes auditory and optic radiation. In this picture, this is not pure optic radiation. This is posterior thalamic peduncle. And all posterior thalamic peduncle have a curve, Mayer's curve, Mayer's loop, not only optic radiation, but the, we have to preserve these structures in our surgery. The tapetum is also another uh, for uh, neglected uh, white matter in the temporal lobe. Inferior lung fasciculus also. So our goal is to remove the only amygdala and the alveus, fimbria, fornix, just mediobasal temporal region. And then in the parahippocampal gyrus, inferior arm of the parahippocampal gyrus, uh, the cingulum is there. So inferior arm, and we have to remove. So the, our target is this inferior arm of the cingulum and amygdala, uncus, alveus, fimbria, fornix. So, Transylvian approach is the uh, very suitable approach to get there. So of course, the, as I told you, the development in the MRI, uh, we now clarify better uh, choosing the case because we can see the hippocampal sclerosis very well. And I hope that with seven Tesla MRI, we will see much better. And of course, the uh, PET scan is important and the video EG and the, all these are important. The point is the, how I can remove this uh, amygdala and hippocampus and parahippocampus selective. I call it trans, uh, Sylvian trans amygdala. I do a little uh, different than Professor Yashagi. I go more anterior, I go directly to preform cortex. I go directly preform cortex to amygdala and then remove the amygdala and go back. The problem in this approach, the advantage of this approach to so-called temporal, preserving temporal stem, no danger to uh, for optic radiation, uncinate or front occipital. The problem in this approach, you cannot go more posterior. That's the point. Because in each case, the, of course, depends on the head also, my ability to go posterior is different. Depends on the condition of the brain and how atrophic hippocampus and then the anesthesia. So that or uh, Sylvian uh, anatomy. These, these uh, um, points are controlling my, how much I can go more posterior with trans Sylvian approach. Uh, the main point, as I told you, that I had to go to preform cortex and go directly preform cortex, go directly to amygdala, and then go posterior. This is one of the sample. Uh, left is left always in my MRIs. This is anatomic uh, or for orientation. So this case has a 36 years history of intractable seizures two, three times per week. And he took four anti-epileptic drugs and left-sided clear hippocampal sclerosis, you can see here. And this is very good candidate for left-sided 
Transylvian uh, selective amygdala hippocampectomy. We perform uh, electrodes, of course, in the grid and uh, strip electrodes uh, and check the uh, EEG and then opening Sylvian fissure. That's the point. This, when I open the dura, I can tell that how difficult surgery is waiting for me. Because the, if the Sylvian fissure is difficult, if the venous anatomy is difficult, if the arachnoid is very thick, so surgery is difficult. For me, the transylvian selective amygdala hippocampectomy means opening Sylvian fissure. Because if I don't open the Sylvian fissure very well, I damage the temporal neocortex, I damage the temporal fold, and this can be uh, the, the reason for uh, not good uh, epilepsy control, because you can create another uh, epileptic uh, point with this way and preserve the old veins. So the, I do not coagulate any sylvian vein. And also, this, you know, the sylvian veins can go frontal to uh, temporal, temporal to frontal. And we should try to preserve and go down to open the sylvian vallecula and opening the uh, arachnoid. Depends on the uh, uh, arachnoid. You know, sometimes you can open with the bipolar. Sometimes you need to use knife. Sometimes you need to use uh, scissors. So, but try to preserve the venous anatomy especially, and try to not retract. I do not use retraction, rigid retraction in any part of this surgery. And when I open the sylvian fissure, I put a strip electrode just underneath the parahippocampal uh, gyrus. And this is very important to localize the uh, seizure activity in the hippocampus and parahippocampal gyrus because the grid electrode can go everywhere. So this is another uh, step in the surgery. And then go, to, this is M1, follow the M1. And here is the preform cortex. And we have to careful with the temporal trunk from M1, because sometimes it can be very big. So this, every case is different. Every case is different. But the key point is the opening of the sylvian fissure. And then just go directly to preform cortex, because underneath the preform cortex, I have amygdala and first coagulating and then removing the uh, preform cortex with CUSA and the suction, subpial, totally subpial removal and the low power CUSA is safe to use there. And I never seen any, uh, you see now the uncus is now clear, uncus. You can see uncus very well. I prefer, uh, prevent, uh, um, keep the uh, PI intact and subtly I remove the uh, uncus, tip of the uncus. I am totally anterior than the meninsula. I am totally anterior. Left side and remove the also rest of the, uh, and now, Subpial, I see the P2. Here is the P2, and there are branches. You know, there are branches from P2 and anterior choroidal artery to uh, hippocampus. And I am removing residual part, and then go a little faster. And now I am getting the anterior choroidal point. This is the uh, ventricle open. I am now reaching the anterior choroidal point. And you see there are hippocampal veins and arteries goes to the subiculum. So I coagulate them and cut another one. This is hippocampal artery. 
Uchimura artery, Uchimura or Uchimura. Japanese colleagues can be correct me. Famous uh, Japanese uh, neurosurgeon. And then go lateral now through the uh, collateral eminence. And then now posterior as possible. You know, this is almost between body and tail. So I go posterior to cut the tail of the hippocampus. You know, they like to have one piece with the, for uh, research. This is the head of the hippocampus and the, uh, some part uh, body of hippocampus. And then the tail of hippocampus, I try to get with the CUSA as posterior as possible. This is the uh, point in this approach that we have very limited uh, angle and very limited space to go, but it can be done. And now opening the posterior part of the choroidal fissure. And again, I can suck it. And this is almost end of surgery, checking with the hemostasis. So end of surgery, the whole neocortex should be untouched. And I like to check with the ICG to see the, how is venous anatomy and how is also, is there any contusion? So in the ICG, you can see very well if there is contusion. And I'm very happy to see this picture that uh, the old veins are intact and I am totally anterior than uh, Limen Insula. Uh, and then I removed the um, amygdala and hippocampus. This is the posterior, uh, post-operative picture. And you can see that left-sided selective amygdala hippocampectomy is done and with preserving uh, ne neocortical structures. Very important. Some people doesn't believe that uncinate fasciculus and frontoccipital fasciculus is intact with this approach. When you go through the amygdala, you don't touch uncinate or famous IFOF. They call IFOF. I think it's correct one is frontoccipital. And the visual field is, I never seen problem with the visual field with this approach. Mayer's loop is much more posterior than uncinate and uh, front occipital. And this is now seizure free. Another case, this is now the right side, right side of hippocampal sclerosis. Very clear hippocampal sclerosis, right side. And very nice case for uh, selective hippocampectomy. Now this is the right size uh, sylvian fissure, the more complicated uh, venous anatomy. And what we put grids and electrodes and, and opening sylvian fissure is the key. Again, I mentioned slowly, slowly, but try to preserve every vein, everything, as much as possible. This even small vein, nothing may happen, but it's better to preserve. And the same technique, just go to preform cortex. Now you see internal carotid is here and the preform cortex uncus is here. So I go directly to uncus, just coagulate the uh, pia arachnoid and go remove the amygdala. And then you see, I am totally anterior than M1. This is the very important. You have to stay anterior than M1 and go lateral. And now the more post, med, now medial picture, the opening the uh, choroidal fissure and removing head of hippocampus. And now the posterior part, I'm cutting the lateral and posterior part of the hippocampus, parahippocampal gyrus. And this is the fimbria fornix. 
right side. Again, to remove one piece. And the rest, I will remove with the suction and the fusa. I try to go as, this is collateral sulcus. I try to go as posterior as possible. And then that's it. And then uh, most of the time I prefer to check with the endoscope. What is the situation? Because I am working in very small uh, gap. So it's nice to see endoscope, internal carotid is here, midbrain is here, anterior choroidal here. And this is now the posterior part. Not bad. I did very well posterior resection with, in this case. Not always possible, as I told you. Uh, this is the limitation of this approach. And this is end of surgery. All the venous anatomy is intact, the temporal hole and everything is intact. And ICG also demonstrates intact uh, structures. This is post-operative uh, uh, picture. And as I told you, temporal stem is intact and the uncinate and front occipital is intact because I stay totally anterior than M1. And and normal visual field. So what was my problem that I also use another approach to selective hippocampectomy? The point started uh, in this kind of cases. If the lesion, if the tumor is totally in mediobasal temporal region, from preformed cortex to isthmus, I cannot get this in one session. I have to do anterior resection with the transylvian, and then the second session, I have to go posterior to remove the posterior part. There is no way to remove this tumor in one session, except if you go from neocortex, you can do it, but this is not in our discussion. So we do not recommend this. So the point started with this way. So the point started how I can get the more, more posterior hippocampus. So for this, sometimes we have to change our view. So you see, when we change the angle, we can see the uh, face of the uh, Inca when we look different. So we have to look different. So Professor Yashargi looked different many years ago to remove the posterior parapocampal avascular lesion using uh, supracerebellar transtentorial approach. And then he used in one case for cavernoma. And he told me that this approach should be revitalized. You have to study this approach. This was his point. But he told this everywhere, not only me. And I had great uh, chance to work in Little Rock in the Professor El Mefti's laboratory to study the anatomy. So the idea is, you know, from if you've come from anterior, you cannot get posterior. But if you come from posterior, you may get everything entirely. So just this could be the real selective amygdala hippocampus. And how we can do this? The, because the problem is one third of the uh, mediobasal temporal region is in the middle fossa. How we can get the middle fossa from uh, posterior fossa? So this is cadaveric study from Little Rock. If we cut the whole tentorium, this is our uh, limit in the tentorium. The, the anterior part is totally in middle fossa. This is cadaver. And I, I simulate surgery to do in the cadaver, cut the tentorium. And then I remove the amygdala and uh, uncus in the cadaver. And I see the carotid and posterior communicating. And then when I did big resection, this is very clear approach that you can get all mediobasal temporal region. But this was the anatomic study. I didn't publish this because I had to do one surgery, then confirm that this approach is suitable or feasible. I had to wait 10 years to perform one, uh, my first surgery for this approach. There were many reasons for that. During this time, Professor Yonekawa published his paper. I was really, when I see this paper in the journal, I was getting heart attack, but I, I was happy later because he described the only posterior region. You know, my goal was taking the 
entire length of the mediobasal temporal region. But Professor Yonekawa described this approach for posterior mediobasal temporal region. Also, Professor Oliveira performed this approach and he described also, but posterior. I use this approach for entire length of the mediobasal temporal region to remove amygdala and uh, uncus. Anyway, 10 years later, I got this patient and I find that this is suitable case and this is excellent case for supracerebellar transtentorial approach. And the semi-sitting position is the key on the success of this surgery. 25 degrees enough for semi-sitting position. With 25 degree, we do not have any problem with the air embolism. Transesophageal Doppler is the, should be obligatory because you can see any single bubble before any uh, problem. And then paramedian incision, uh, supracerebellar incision. Another point is the microscope. I am very happy that, lucky that I am using Professor Yashagi's original microscope from Zurich because it is very short, very light, no autofocus, no zoom. And I can work 10 hours in semi-sitting position in this way. So this is right-sided craniotomy. And then when we cut, open the dura, you can see the tumor, it's hanging here. When you cut the tentorium, it's there. And this is after resection. And this is endoscopic picture. Choroid plexus here is the uh, atrium and the hippocampus, parahippocampal gyrus is gone. Amygdala was here, and this is internal carotid artery. This is third nerve, and this is anterior choroidal artery, and this is posterior, fetal type of posterior communicating artery. So this is the case. Postoperatively, we remove entire lingual mediobasal temporal region using this approach. And of course, there is no need for this because we don't touch them. They are in the roof of the temporal horn and the advantage of this approach. And then I said, why not to do in hippocampus, selective hippocampectomy? Because especially this case is suitable because this is posteriorly uh, clear, posterior hippocampal sclerosis. So in this case, Transylvian approach, maybe I cannot get it. So I use this approach for hippocampus. I start to use this approach for hippocampal sclerosis, and now is my favorite. And this is the left sided, and uh, this is you can do depth electrode, and then this is after resection. Uh, left side tentorium is here. The amygdala was here. This is roof of the temporal horn, lateral geniculate body, cerebral peduncle, cerebellum, uh, internal carotid here, A1 here, M1 here, tentorial hiatus here. And this is more selective resection of entire mediobasal temporal region. I removed the tail of hippocampus also with this way. And now I prefer this approach. Why I prefer? Believe or not, it is easier than Transylvian for me. It is easier. Transylvian approach sh should be done very elegantly, not easy. And I can remove all entire hippocampus and also without touching any neocortex. And you know, the Pablo even says that he didn't remove the amygdala. Pablo, you have to remove amygdala. Amygdala is the easiest part of the surgery. This is the, my position when I remove amygdala. Amygdala is just front of you. The most difficult point in this surgery is the opening of tentorium. If you open the tentorium very well, your surgery is done. And the difficult part is also to remove the middle fossa part of the parahippocampal gyrus, especially in the brachycephalic heads, it's difficult to get in the microscope. So I use endoscope for this. And this is postoperative picture. I remove entire mediobasal uh, hippocampus and without touching the uh, temporal stem or anything. And this is post-operative. All structures are intact and visual field is intact and no seizures. Mm -hmm.
The patient is a I, uh, I have no time to show this video. Is it correct? I have nine minutes video uh, to describe this approach, but I think no time. Doctor. We'll grant you the nine minutes, uh, Professor Kavei. So, the patient is a 30-year-old woman who has had automotor epilepsy since the age of 16. She has had three... This is, uh, this is typical uh, patient with the, uh, hippocampal sclerosis. Use the paramedian supracerebellar transtentorial approach for lesions in the entire length of the mediobasal temporal region. We also use this approach for mediobasal temporal sclerosis, which is actually a disease of the archicortex. We prefer placing the patient in the semi-sitting position. 25 degrees of head elevation is usually enough for this approach. In case of cardiac septal defect, we have to go a little faster. Superior craniotomy is done. First burn hole is placed above the right transverse sinus. A small is incision is made in the lower corner of the craniotomy to access the cisterna magna in order to drain CSF. A silicone drain is left in the cistern for continuous drainage. The main dural incision is made about two centimeter below the transverse sinus. An advantage of the semi-sitting position is that gravity allows the cerebellum to drop downward and there is no need for retraction. We always try to preserve the tentorial bridging veins by mobilizing the veins and wrapping them with surgical. Deeper in the supracerebellar space, the arachnoid is dissected and the fourth nerve is identified. An L-shaped tentorial incision is made with one leg approaching the tentorial hiatus and the other reaching toward the petros ridge. Depending on the variation of the tentorial bridging veins and venous lakes, the tentorial incision may be modified to save these structures. With this custom-made needle, it is easier to place hanging sutures on tentorial leaflets to expose the mediobasal temporal region. The middle portion of the mediobasal temporal region is exposed. A strip electrode is placed along the parahippocampal gyrus. The EEG shows the epileptiform activity of the cortex. The strip <coughs> electrode is now removed and a depth electrode is placed in the hippocampus through the hole made in the posterior parahippocampal gyrus. Epileptiform activity, especially in the posterior hippocampus, is recorded. The inferior colliculus is the main landmark to start resection of the parahippocampal gyrus. This is also the posterior limit of the resection. Starting at the level of the colliculus, we coagulate and cut the surface of the parahippocampal gyrus. The subiculum is then removed subpially with gentle aspiration. The P3 segment of the posterior cerebral artery is seen. The posterior aspect of the parahippocampal gyrus is resected subpially until the ventricle is entered. At this point, the hippocampal formation aligns with the surgical corridor. The tail of the hippocampus is dissected together with the fimbria. The choroidal fissure is opened and dissection is carried out, approaching the uncus.
the uncal and hippocampal arteries are coagulated and cut. The uncus is then resected subpially. The hippocampus is dissected through the collateral eminence. The hippocampus is resected in one piece to be used for research. A cotonoid is placed underneath the parahippocampal gyrus. This maneuver brings the remaining inferior part of the parahippocampal gyrus into view. This portion is then removed. The amygdala is identified by its grayish color under the ependymal layer. It is then removed subpially. After hemostasis is obtained, the surgical field is visualized with the high-definition neuroendoscope. The perforators, the anterior choroidal artery, and P2 and P3 segments of the posterior cerebral artery are seen. This is the bed of the amygdala, which is now removed to expose the internal carotid artery and its branches through the pia. So, and then a certain depth. We close it, and uh, this is the postoperative picture. And but she, uh, I think I have to stop now. Just to mention that for me, you know, the all of the cases, almost Professor Yashargil was behind me, and he uh, encouraged me, and he gave the idea to do this approach, and I'm very happy that he accepted this approach that he says that this is better approach, but it's more difficult than Transylvian. This is his comment. For me, easier. I think this is depends on the uh, experience because he is the Transylvian. His brain is Transylvian. So, but anyway, I now prefer this approach for uh, hippocampal sclerosis, but if the patient has a cardiac septal defect, or if there is possibility to do temporal lobectomy, if it's not clear case, I use pterenal approach. Otherwise, I use this approach. And for me, the both approach is effective and nicely uh, can be done, but I personally prefer uh, this approach because the posterior hippocampal sclerosis I can remove better. And also the removal of amygdala. I can remove almost 100% of amygdala using supracerebellar because in Transylvian, medial side of amygdala is not clear. So we can leave 20 to, 20, 10 to 20% of amygdala we have to leave. But in this approach, you, have, you can remove the amygdala. And and I hope the young generation uh, will accept this approach. And, uh, and I would like to thank especially my mentor, Professor Yashargil, especially to encouraging me to perform this approach. And I hope next year we can meet in our meeting in Istanbul. Uh, I hope COVID-19 will be resolved at the time. Thank you for your attention. Congratulations, Professor Ugur today for your brilliant presentation on selective amygdala hippocampectomy technique, highlighting the importance of the study of the cortical and subcortical anatomy of the brain, the preoperative studies of each individual patient to perform effective and safe procedures for our patients. For all young uh, neurosurgeons like me, 
who have learned from your research publications and your lectures around the world. It is a great honor to have you again as a speaker in our Anatomy Committee WBF, WFNS webinar. Thanks again. And um, one concept that uh, has been emphasized is preserving the arachnoid and normal pia matter during the dissection of the sylvan fissure in order to avoid possible uh, new epilepsy focus. And I want to ask you, what is your opinion about uh, the direct access to the most medial portion of the sylvian fissure and the temporal uncus using the supraorbital trans approach? I mean, um, the best approach to the hippocampus and amygdala could be transorbital, if you can do it. <laughs> I'm not yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> if you can do it, the best one is transorbital. So, the, but eyebrow incision is, you know, I am not very happy with it. Because I am not sure that it is more cosmetic. And with eyebrow incision, you have to retract more. This is, you know, what I saw. Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, this is also another way. You know, we have to be open-minded. If you do sure. it, I like to see. And then, uh, as I told you, the orbital, maybe trans palpebral go to hippocampus could be the best way. But if something happened, what you can do? How you can manage the any bleeding or any problem, you know, when you create a surgical approach, you have to be ready any problems. <clears throat> you have to be able to be deal with any problems. This is the key. Otherwise, it can be done. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Ture. Thank you very much. I don't know if there is any, any, any question for Professor Ugur Ture for, from the oh, panelists. Excellent, congratulations. And uh, I'm extremely glad that you proposed this uh, suprasebral infradental approach. I love it and it's uh, in my hands, it's the most flexible approach to, to many, many lesions. It's uh, on a par with uh, trigonal craniotomy, I guess. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. you. There, and sitting position, next yeah. point. Thanks. I look forward to see you next year in semi sure. sitting position. Sure, we'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> we have to realize semi sitting position. <laughs> yeah. May I make a comment? Uh, wonderful presentation, and I think that this uh, super cerebellar uh, approach is, uh, is uh, very, very important and has to be. Uh, taught to young people. Me too, I am a, I am a pupil of uh, Yashagil, but uh, I will spend a little bit uh, 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 of the advantage of the Olivier approach, of the Montreal approach for the amygdala hippocampectomy when you de decide to go anteriorly through uh, uh, T1 and T2, just for the young people. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Any comments? Okay, thank you again, Professor Ugur Ture, um, for your support uh, to our committee. We are really happy to have you here with us. Thank you again. Okay, following with the, the next speaker, um, from the University of Lausanne. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to me to present a close friend uh, um, with a special topic about uh, hemispherotomy and quadrantotomy uh, techniques. It's a huge pleasure to present uh, to Professor Roy Thomas Daniel um, uh, and uh, go ahead. Thank you, Roy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthias. Uh, thank you, Imad uh, and Vladimir, for uh, allowing me to talk on my favorite topic. Um, and thank you, Professor Ture. Your uh, talk was excellent, and I really loved the videos. 
So we are just moving a little bit away from adult epilepsy on into the, the sphere of uh, pediatric epilepsy, which is what my specialty is. And I've been asked to talk on uh, the techniques that I used uh, preferentially, most, mostly all, almost always in, uh, in children, which is the hemispherotomy and the quadrant otomies, though there are some indications in adults as well. Now, when you talk about uh, epilepsy in children, the, one of the important considerations uh, to keep in mind is that you need to think about uh, the brain development. So in the first decade of life, uh, these are the, the, the events that happen of the dendritic branching and synaptogenesis and the maximum synaptic density and uh, therefore maximum cortical plasticity uh, happens uh, during the first decade. And then in the second decade, you start seeing synaptive regression and selective cell death. Now, how does uh, seizures and intractable seizures uh, impact, therefore, when you have children who, who present with uh, intractable epilepsy, how does their brain develop? Now, we, we do know many things from uh, clinical data and also from uh, laboratory data in vivo uh, and uh, in, in vitro, uh, experiments that show that uh, the transient anoxia, interictal discharges, and even the postictal depression, they, they, they inhibit the physiological stability of the developing brain, changes the electrical milieu. And uh, one thing that needs to be considered for development is also the environmental stimuli. And that's uh, not very evident in adults, but in children, it makes a major uh, influence on the development of synaptogenesis, which is essentially how the brain develops. So, and when you have children with more than 100 seizures per day, you have a lot of sensory deprivation. These are children that don't go to school. They, don't, they hardly talk to their parents, and you find that they do not reach the cognitive uh, milestones. In fact, you even get regression. And then Many of these children are on multiple anti-epileptic drugs. And when you have drugs which are at very high doses, they also adversely affect the brain. And so axonal growth and synaptogenesis is, uh, is uh, adversely affected because of seizures. And that's why it needs to be done, these uh, techniques uh, of pediatric epilepsy surgery. And essentially, the techniques are the follows. You have seen a little bit of lesionectomy that Pablo talked of. And he showed beautiful examples of that and lesionectomy and lobectomies. I'll be dealing with hemispherotomy and quadrantotomy. Professor Schwartz talked about LIT, we have, uh, which is a new technique that's coming up. Radio surgery for uh, hypothalamic hamartomas, especially, uh, are known to be very good. And of course, vagal nerve stimulation for intractable multifocal epilepsy and some experience with DBS. But this lecture is essentially on the hemispherotomy and quadrantotomy for, uh, for pediatric epilepsy surgery. So what are the diseases that we are dealing with? We are dealing with, uh, give you some examples. This is, uh, these are children who are born with what's called infantile hemiplegia seizure syndrome. So one half of the brain due to some perinatal uh, uh, vascular event uh, uh, does not develop properly. Uh, and that is one uh, common cause. Another congenital cause is the Sturge Weber syndrome. As you see, these uh, tram like calcifications, this leptomeningeal angiomatosis, uh, that's another one. And then you have a very atypical one. All these diseases atrophy the brain, except for hemimegalencephaly, which is a kind of hypertrophic dysplasia of the cortex on, on one side. And then, of course, one of the one of the uh, the acquired ones. Uh, all the others that we spoke of till now are the congenital. Uh, you have Rasmussen's encephalitis, which is acquired. So you have a normal child around the age of uh, six or seven starts uh, getting a kind of autoimmune uh, encephalitis involving only one hemisphere or a major part of that hemisphere, and progressively the hemisphere atrophies and presents with intractable epilepsy. So these are the diseases that we are dealing with in hemispheric epilepsy. What are the goals of hemispheric epilepsy surgery? Obviously, it's to eliminate seizures. But more importantly, if you eliminate seizures, you help psychomotor development. Now, at the same time, you should not uh, increase the neurological deficits. If, you, if you're able to achieve these three objectives, you can get this child back into, into normal society and have cognitive development. So to put it in a nutshell, this is what we're talking about. 
this, you have one bad hemisphere and you have a good hemisphere. Now, if you completely disconnect the bad hemisphere, you're allowing the good hemisphere to develop. Essentially, what you're hoping for is a, a double hemisphere. So you have one hemisphere that's left and it assumes the role which was destined for the bad hemisphere. So, and that's how these children get back into normal society and uh, develop uh, skills. So uh, the, the most radical of these procedures is what is termed as the peri-insular hemispherotomy. So the steps go through these and these you go through specific windows as you can see here, you have the supra-insular window, you have the infra-insular window, and then you need to do uh, the insular stage, which I'll show shortly. Now, in the supra-insular window, what you want to do is to remove a little bit of the operculum here and go head straight to the ventricle. And you need to do it through the entire window. And what are you doing in that process? You are interrupting, starting with the U-fibers of the frontoparietal lobe the anterior and posterior limbs of the internal capsule, and then of course the uncinate, the arcuate, the IFOF, they are all sectioned as we go deeper into the ventricle. Uh, in, in, during the same window, you through the inside, you do a parasagittal callosotomy. So you're inside the ventricle and from inside, you, you do an inverse callosotomy over the entire length of the corpus callosum. So, and it should be completely done to, to get a good result. Uh, and then at the end of your galasotomy, you will come across the phonics which, uh, which you cut and that allows you to completely deafferent the majority of the output of the temporal lobe. Uh, and then uh, through the supra-insular window, there's one area that you have not addressed, which is the, the medial and the basal part of the frontal lobe. And that also needs to be disconnected because you don't want to go and disconnect the anterior commissure. So it's an easier way of uh, dealing with that solution by disconnecting this cortex that remains connected through the anterior commissure. Then of course you go to the infra-insular window. So, so the same steps, you follow in the, remove a little bit of the temporal operculum and you head straight to the ventricle as you can see here. And what you're doing is that you start off with the temporal U fibers and then as you go deeper, you cut the sub and retroventricular parts of the internal capsule. And then from inside you do uh, remove the amygdala and the anterior head of the hippocampus, because again, these are not completely disconnected during your procedure. The hippocampotomy was earlier done, so that is been already taken care of. And then all you're left with is the insular stage of the operation. And through both windows, you disconnect the insula at the level of the extreme or the external capsule. So that completes the whole procedure. And what do you get uh, at the end of uh, 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 the surgery? If you look at the, the pre and the post here, you see the white traces are the ipsilateral ECOG electrodes. And then as, as soon as you start the disconnection, you'll start seeing uh, the increase of the interictal discharges of the disconnected hemisphere. So many of the inhibitory connections that go through the corpus callosum uh, allows an increase of the interictal discharges of the uh, of the damaged cortex, of the atrophic cortex. So that is not a problem because the, it has been completely disconnected. And then you find that uh, in the contralateral hemisphere, after your disconnection is over, you find that the interictal discharges, which were evident before surgery, uh, disappear almost completely. So if you put it in a graphical form, you can see it through the windows and you find that as, as soon as you do the calosotomy, that the discharges from the contralateral normal hemisphere completely, uh, completely disappears. Now we come to the other uh, part the, uh, of the talk, which is the subhemispheric epilepsy. Now, anything that is not hemispheric and involves about half of the brain can be termed as subhemispheric epilepsy. So we prefer to divide it into two quadrants. So you have the anterior quadrant, which is the large frontal lobe and the posterior quadrant, which is the temporoparietal occipital lobes, which is, this is an artificial description, so uh, it doesn't matter how you call it, but as long as you understand what it is. Uh, many of these uh, people, children, have preserved uh, or residual motor function, so you have to make sure that you're not losing function while you're disconnecting to treat epilepsy. And of course, it has to be a static condition. You cannot have a dynamic illness. You cannot do the surgery for a progressive uh, disease. 
So what you're hoping to do is a disconnection of the epileptogenic uh, quadrant. So this is uh, this was our first description of uh, the posterior quadrantic epilepsy surgery, which is the periinsular posterior quadrantotomy. Now it's done for diseases of the temporal uh, diseases restricted to the temporal, occipital, and the parietal lobe. So in these children, the the front uh, the Rolandic cortex is still functional. So we have to keep that intact. And so this is the disconnection that allows you to completely disconnect the temporopareto occipital lobes. So to just to quickly go through it, some of this might be repetition. So this is the infrainsular window where you see how the retro and sublentiform parts of the internal capsule disconnects these lobes. Again, you remove the amygdala and the anti-hippocampectomy and uh, anti-hippocampectomy and the phonics is cut. Now, what is different from hemispherotomy is here, you have the frontal lobe, which is normal. So you need to do uh, an intraparietal disconnection. So the, the normal frontal lobe has to be disconnected from the damaged uh, pareto occipito temporal. So the intraparietal association fibers need to be disconnected, the SLF, and then of course you have to do a posterior chalazotomy to complete the disconnection. Now we come to the anterior quadrantotomy. Now this is a similar thing, but here you have the exact opposite. You have a frontal lobe, which is normal. You have preserved motor function because the Rolandic cortex is okay. The central lobe is okay. And the parietal, temporal and occipital lobes are all functional and are normal and are not epileptogenic. So this is the technique that we described a few years back in which you do this, con this kind of uh, disconnection. You can see a slice again. The principles of uh, disconnective surgery is exactly the same. So you remove a little bit of the opercular cortex and then you go and head to the ventricle which disconnects the projection fibers. So, and then to keep, to disconnect the frontal lobe from sending the impulses onto the normal parietal, central parietal occipital lobes, you need to do an intrafrontal disconnection. So this is the lateral view of that. And this is the mesial, uh, medial uh, view of that uh, disconnection. Then from inside the ventricle, the anterior part of the chalazotomy has to be done to, to make sure that the discharges do not go to the contralateral hemisphere. And then again, the, the to, to avoid discharges going through the anterior commissure, you need to do a frontal basal disconnection. So uh, we did some, uh, some really good work with Pablo in, in his lab and just, uh, just quickly show you the white matter uh, disconnections uh, done in the lab that was, uh, that was showing how the periinsular anterior quadrantotomy is done. So this is the incision that we are doing. So you have the pars opercularis here. So you need to take it at that level and get it anterior anterior to the Rolandic cortex. So that's F1, F2, and F3 here. You can see the peri, the central lobe, which is the peri-Rolandic cortex that is preserved in this case. If you look at it from the mesial side, you see the genu of the rostrum and the body. So it goes at, at the junction between the genu and the body a little bit posterior at exactly the same point that uh, the convexity incision reaches the midline. And then look at the basal lobe, you'll see that you go at the posterior, at the level of the posterior orbitofrontal gyrus to make sure that the entire frontal lobe is disconnected. So just some sequential pictures that show once the white matter is removed, you start seeing the, the U fibers and then you start seeing the SLF here. Then you come to the extreme capsule, uh, the, ex uh, the external capsule and the extreme capsule, as you can see here, as you go along these dissections, you can see very well the, the fibers that you have to cut. This is the SLF here, the external capsule, the IFOF and the ancinate fascicle is beautifully dissected here. And there you see as the dissection goes deeper, the putamen, the frontopontine fibers here, the, the, and the, finally the ependyma of the ventricle. So these are the parts of the internal capsule that's, uh, that's disconnected here. These are the projection fibers of the lobe that we want to disconnect. And, and once we open the ventricle, and this you do a, again a parasagittal chalazotomy from inside, you see the body of the body of uh, the uh, corpus callosum, 
the genu and the rostrum. So at the body here, that's where your incision disconnects in a parasagittal plane. Now, if you do further disconnections, you see uh, the anatomy of the of the anterior commissure, but this is taken care of by the frontobasal disconnection, which cuts uh, these fibers that go towards the anterior commissure. This is a beautiful view from the basal side, and it's not a very common view in textbooks. You can see how the uh, the, the the anterior commissure. You can see these fibers here, uh, the genu of the uh, corpus callosum. These uh, show the anatomy of the basal view of the frontal lobe and the disconnections at that, uh, that point. Another technique that we published recently is the uh, prefrontal lobotomy. And this is for a more anterior epileptogenic lesion uh, in which uh, the disconnection is uh, taken uh, uh, anterior to the anterior quadrantotomy. So, to put it into perspective, you can see you need a much smaller craniotomy for that. And here you see this is where uh, you keep the pars uh, opercularis intact and you take it at the junction of the pars triangularis and the opercularis. And you go across the middle frontal and sup uh, superior frontal gyrus. And then posteriorly, of course, you need, these are the four orbitofrontal gyri, the lateral, anterior, medial, and posterior, you go at the very posterior limit of the posterior frontal orbital gyrus to achieve a complete uh, disconnection. Now, all these uh, hemispheric epilepsy syndromes or sub-hemispheric epilepsy syndromes, uh, you are very interested in the outcome. The seizure outcome, fortunately, is very, very good. Now, we now have a series of over 100 children, uh, some of them with duration of a very long duration of seizures. And the techniques that you have seen here are the periinsular hemispherotomy in the subhemispheric surgery. Uh, a small group of these children we followed up for many, many years, and we found that they were, uh, and we followed up at, to see how the cognition comes back and and how these children uh, develop uh, skills uh, over long periods of time. But it is a certainty as soon as you seizures stop, the brain start uh, developing. So the the seizure outcome is above 80 percent and that is what allows the brain to develop function. So what we discussed in this article uh, uh, in this uh, presentation is the periinsular hemispherotomy, the prefrontal lobotomy, the posterior quadrantotomy and the anterior quadrantotomy and these are the, the uh, mostly seen in children and gives you excellent outcomes for seizures and allows you to have cognitive development if seizures are controlled. I thank you very much and, uh, and uh, for your patient listening and I'm available for any comments or uh, questions. Matthias, are you there? Yes, I am here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Roy Daniel. Astonishing lecture about the, 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 that special topic of uh, brain uh, quadrantotomy. Thank you very much for your presentation. I don't know if there is some some kind of some some question for Roy. Matthias, we have to limit the question to one or two maximum because okay. Professor brought you, he has some commitment and we are behind okay. time. Okay. Right. So perhaps take okay. one question if there are any. Yeah, there any is a question from uh, Ture. Okay. Go well, ahead, Professor Ture. Uh, this is that question. I just would like to congratulate for his excellent presentation. And he brings this topic here also. Because I am totally agree with him that this is, it looks like crazy surgery, but it is, it, if you choose the correct cases, it has the best results. And this also the periinsular hemispherotomy idea is the great idea. And I just would like to congratulate him to summarize all this 
topic to us and he has a great number of cases. Uh, I would like to thank him. Thank you, Professor Ture. Uh, I agree, yeah. Uh, well, uh, compliments for this presentation. I think that one uh, of this disconnection surgery, because this is something we, we in the previous uh, lecture, we have uh, a, a, a kind of uh, um, exeris of the focus. Here is disconnection of the foci. And I think that you emphasize, has to be emphasized, and you, 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 you say that, that as soon as possible, the decision of surgery has to be done because of plasticity of the cerebellum. And that is a lesson that uh, we have to uh, teach to our friend. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Giovanni. Congratulations again, um, Professor Thomas, uh, Thomas Daniel, uh, for your beautiful lecture. For this connect, it's very important to know how the brain is connected, <laughs> previous, of course. And it's important to highlight the importance of the study of of the white matter of the, the hemisphere in order to perform this, this kind of complex and crazy surgeries like Professor Ture said previously. Thank you again for this beautiful presentation. And um, passing to our next speaker, uh, it's a huge honor to present uh, to Professor Giovanni Brogi from Italy with a beautiful topic, uh, that is functional neurosurgery for tremor surgery. Go ahead, Professor Giovanni Brogi. Okay, thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, um, Imad and Vladimir to give me the opportunity uh, to, uh, to participate to this uh, wonderful webinar. And I think that uh, uh, we can, uh, I can uh, give a little bit of uh, experience to a younger surgeon, uh, I, our young colleagues. Do you see my slide? Yes. Okay. So we change completely the, the, the topics from epilepsy, we go to movement disorders. And one of the most wide movement disorders uh, is the tremor. So let's go and uh, give a, a kind of overview of this kind of problem. Of course, we have, I have no uh, disclosure. A little bit of history. Stereotactic neurosurgery started a two, almost two centuries ago from uh, Sir Vistor Osley. But it's uh, only after the Second World that Spiegel and Weiss is uh, giving impulses of that and that there are other pioneers on this <clears throat> kind of uh, 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 technique of neurosurgery. Uh, Tyler, Jean Tylerac, last Excel, that uh, is, is the father also of the gamma knife and the radiosurgery, and, uh, and Mundinger, Richard and Mundinger in the 58. But let's go to the, to the tremor. There is a different type of tremor. I think that, uh, that this, uh, this uh, uh, um, Roster is, is due more for uh, uh, young uh, uh, colleagues. We have the essential tremor or the familiar tremor that is uh, uh, the more benign one, uh, let's say, also invalidating as all this kind of uh, symptoms. that is in during the dystonia uh, dystonia uh, disease and we will heard coops uh, later on that he would talks about that uh, topic in particular there is the orthostatic tremor that are more known as a shaky leg uh, syndrome the cerebellar tremor that is typical of uh, of uh, multiple sclerosis and one thing that has to be in uh, keep in mind that, that there is a functional tremor so psychogenic tremor that is kind of tremor that is due to a uh, psychological situation and to, the, is, uh, is uh, to be uh, 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 taken out when one has to bring, bring the decision to do any kind of therapy. Medical therapy, 
therapy that are not medical but uh, are uh, 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 let's say not so invasive as surgery and surgical approach like uh, lesional surgery radio surgery uh, dbs uh, deep brain stimulation or focus ultrasound medical therapy for tremor you have here the list Remember that also alcohol is a therapy for tremor. I mean, it's not a, a therapy, it's, it's taking care of tremor, but it's a, a disease inside of the disease. This is an, uh, another um, uh, uh, type of uh, the uh, drugs that uh, can be used and should be used before going to surgery. But uh, you see, there is no, no evidence uh, uh, of uh, that there is only one uh, the drugs that is taking care of uh, complete tremor. Let's go to this kind of uh, uh, diagnostic or symptomato symptoms uh, uh, of the different type of tremor. The Parkinsonian tremor, tremor in Parkinson is, is something that is different of the other motor symptom of Parkinson, the rigidity and, uh, and uh, anemia and so. And uh, in, effect, in fact, is not correlated with the bradykinesia, and uh, it can appear and disappear during the progression of the disease. Uh, and uh, is not uh, tied up with the striatal dopamine depletion, so it's, it's, uh, there is no need to do uh, the PET study to see if uh, the, uh, the, the receptors of the dopamine are, are gone or not. Uh, this, uh, this is a very nice... Uh, <coughs> sketch in which you can see uh, uh, the the uh, the onset of the 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 anatomical uh, and chemical situation modulation or situation of uh, that uh, of a uh, uh, basal ganglia in which parkinson disease is coming out and you see here with the with the arrow the place in which uh, stimulation or lesion can be done and I have to remember that the motor cortex was proposed by Horsley uh, at the beginning of the, of the uh, 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 last centuries. Uh, the big problem is that there is no uh, uh, medical effect for a long time and if the tremor is the resistance there is only this kind of uh, therapy that we have to discuss today. Essential tremor, familiar tremor, uh, is starting from the from, from the uh, uh, pediatric age and is increasing during the age, and uh, of course is is becoming invalidating uh, mainly in the second part of the life, and that is something that has to be taken care uh, with uh, uh, this uh, two type of approach. Orthostatic tremor, shaky leg syndrome. Uh, again, is uh, is uh, not so uh, uh, often uh, diagnosis, uh, and uh, is typical of uh, a tremor that's affecting the legs and the, the trunk when the when the patient is standing, but is uh, uh, is invalidating as well as the one of the upper limb. Um, for this kind of uh, uh, of uh, uh, tremor, uh, it was proposed also spinal cord stimulation. That is a little bit out of uh, what we want to discuss today. Tremor in dystonia. There is two type of tremor: dystonic tremor, and I will show you uh, the video, and tremor associated with uh, uh, dystonic syndrome. So uh, this is a, a flow chart, and uh, you see that there is a drug option, uh, botulin toxin option, but if the tremor is becomes severe and in uh, the impairment uh, of uh, quality of life is very important, the only things to do is lesioning or uh, of, uh, uh, deep brain stimulation of different targets. Cerebellar tremor. Cerebellar tremor is, is typical of, uh, uh, of multiple sclerosis patients. And uh, that is is to be take, uh, 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 the patient, the, the neurologist and neurosurgeon has to take care of this patient because they are invalidated and, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, surgery of uh, uh, thalamic uh, uh, lesion or, or uh, stimulation may change the quality of life of those patients. There is a very rare tremor in uh, peripheral neuropathies 
that uh, has to be uh, diagnosed, uh, diagnosed with uh, with the different uh, electrophysiological matter, and uh, DBS is the best uh, way to treat uh, this kind of uh, patient. And uh, and that is the functional tumor. Everyone that is dealing with the movement disorders has uh, to be aware of this possibility and. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, anamnesis and the contact with the patient has to be very, very important. And the neuropsychological and psychiatric uh, uh, analysis before going to uh, surgery has to be done to avoid to make therapy in patients that do not did completely. And on this proposal, there is a, a lot of... Uh, uh, literature that is uh, uh, mainly in, in the past that is uh, uh, related to the uh, non-invasive therapy and you see uh, from uh, physiotherapy to other type of uh, uh, tricks to uh, in, impair the presence of the tremor. So now let's go to neurosurgery. In the past, uh, till, uh, the, till uh, the end of the 80s, uh, stereotaxis radiofrequent lesioning was the, uh, the only way to, to do, to treat uh, this kind of uh, uh, symptoms. And uh, the, uh, you see here and, uh, in uh, our group, and uh, I personally, I am responsible for almost all these patients uh, went to talamotomy for for tremor and and Parkinson disease and dystonia, but we are talk, to talk about tremor. The uh, limits of the lesioning to with the radio frequencies as to have, you have to insert a, an electrode uh, that can be removed afterward. Uh, uh, the limits are due mainly by age and the comorbidity. And uh, one big problem is that you cannot, uh, uh, although you can check during the uh, during the uh, uh, surgery, can check the patient that is awake. Uh, capsular deficit may come out later on due to the cytotoxic uh, uh, edema or lesioning. Uh, that is the results in our series. Uh, as you see here, the results are excellent in the beginning, in, a, in immediately after the surgery, almost 90%. Uh, but in the long term, the effect is uh, decreased. And um, although it's 50%, uh, still in a, a very good uh, uh, situation. From the 90s, uh, come out the, brains, the deep brain stimulation. Uh, it was uh, a, the a genius of Benami that Siegfried that, that understand that was possible to do uh, uh, chronic stimulation because uh, to do uh, lesioning, you have to make simulation. That was one of the check in, inside of the, the operating uh, theater. Today is the... Uh, uh, standard treatment for movement disorders, both for tremor, for dystonia, and for Parkinson's, and I think that uh, uh, Philip Scoops and uh, Andres Lozano will uh, give uh, better uh, uh, news and, uh, and uh, 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 comments on this. The advantage of the, the, the deep brain stimulation is that, of course, is effective, but that is reversible and that is something that's fascinating our friend neurologists and the possible modulation because they are still after after we do the surgery uh, they, they they can uh, follow the patient in uh, in let's say uh, neurological way uh, and uh, and that is something that is um, uh, proposed the uh, widespread of this kind of uh, uh, of this kind of technique. Disadvantage, age limitation and comorbidity because you have to go inside of the brain and you have to pass through the brain. And we know that every passage of the brain for a, 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 for, for a, a shunt or for a, by a stereotactic biopsy, so is scanning out a 2% of more than 2% of, of uh, um, hemorrhage, and, and that is one limitation. The other limitation is very important. This is technological and economical, because deep brain stimulation is very 
expensive, and I don't think that uh, worldwide can be uh, can be uh, used in uh, every center. So I think that you have to keep in mind uh, that uh, lesioning may in in country in which you have no the possibility to do DBS is still a very good tool. Although uh, uh, later on we will show a very high technology and way to make the lesion today. This is our uh, experience on Tremor. Uh, you see here uh, almost 50% uh, that means uh, at that time with DBS, uh, uh, 10 patients per, uh, uh, per year, uh, per, uh, 10 patients per year, uh, almost. Uh, uh, that this is the, the, the literature, and you see here the DBS for essential Tremor uh, increasing in numbers. And this is the results in long term uh, with the long follow up and is uh, passing from uh, the 25 to almost 90%. So the selection of the patient still very, very important as for all indication for uh, surgery, for surgery and neurosurgery particularly. Let's go DBS and, and uh, essential tremor. You see here that the, uh, uh, the the uh, effect is losing during the time. So it's not a kind of uh, 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 miraculous situation, is treating a, a, a symptoms and the, the, the results are very good, but are not as standing during the time, mainly because in uh, in uh, some in the patient is getting old and the circuit are uh, decreasing the efficacy. Uh, Parkinson disease. Parkinson disease is very uh, important because it's related to Parkinson, but is not related to the other uh, symptoms. Uh, but you see here the pre and post. You will see on this particular patient that is a Parkinsonian, is the face. You see this is on off, is off therapy, off stimulation, and you see the shaking. While you see here the movement, also the, the head, and after the surgery, the Patient remain a Parkinsonian in, with the rigidity and anemia, but the movement are most uh, almost normal. Orthostatic tremor and DBS. You see here that uh, the uh, scale are showing that there is a fantastic improvement in the uh, first six months, but is the the effect again is uh, limited and is decreasing but is staying in 50% of the patient uh, as long as they leave. Um, dystonia and tremor. Uh, this is, a, is an example of uh, a tremor in a dystonic patient. Uh, the, pa the patient is dystonic and the tremor is coming out. And this one is the dystonic tremor. You will see here, this, it's, it looks like almost normal. And when is uh, making the movement, you see that there is the uh, the end of the uh, of the uh, task is coming out. Um, deep, yeah, the deep brain stimulation for uh, both dystonic and essential tremor. You see here that this. Uh, uh, there is a, in a, a very good uh, uh, results following the different scale, more with the dystonic tremor than the essential tremor. And this is the recommendation that is from the American Association. And is we are lesioning with thalamotomy, uh, stimulation with uh, with the deep brain stimulation, and. Uh, uh, and uh, we will see uh, again another type of lesioning. Lesioning, you can do lesioning with uh, radio surgery, gamma knife or a cyber knife. You see here the lesion and you see the, the improvement of the 
task uh, on the uh, dominant hand. The only problem, <coughs> and the, the results are staying because the lesioning is coming out in uh, during the time as uh, all the uh, radiological lesioning. The effect is very good. The only the only problem is that you have to. Uh, uh, wait time before the, the results are coming, uh, the, the control of tumor is coming out. And, uh, 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 well, it's, uh, it's something, if you're in the center and you have a machine or technique of radiosurgery, is uh, inexpensive in comparison of, of uh, the brain stimulation. And now the, the, the most uh, uh, recent uh, way to make lesioning, coupling two uh, new things, magnetic resonance and focus ultrasound. If you, you put together and the, the two technology and you can have wonderful results. Uh, first, precision. The precision, the accuracy of the targeting is very good. <coughs> and you see here that uh, the precision of the lesion, the lesion is stay under one millimeter. And we will see that uh, this, uh, this lesion uh, can stay and uh, we will see the result later on. The technique is as uh, simple as like stereotactic technique. Uh, the patient has to be shaved and, uh, and the uh, enamel was to put to, has to be put with the water to cool the uh, skin when the uh, focus ultrasound are passing through. The patient is uh, uh, put into the uh, into the uh, MRI, and the the lesioning is done online under MRI control. That is the advantage of this technique because you can you can make a kind of sony when you find out that the target, you can make a, a sonification. That means eating of the target in a different temperature. So it can be uh, temporary lesioning uh, and you can check the patient during the, the, the lesioning and, uh, and if everything's okay, there is no side effect, you, uh, your target is correct, there is no error on, on the anatomy of the patient, uh, you can make the definitive lesioning. And this is the main advantage of uh, radiofrequency lesioning and uh, radiosurgery because you can control what you are doing in online and you can stop when you have side effect. Uh, the lesion is very, very small, as I said. There is a, a, uh, a in the red, you see the cytotoxic uh, lesioning edema and after the vasogenic edema that's outside. The big advantage, as I say, is that you can control the temperature of the lesion. Uh, more or less, like was was saying, with the lead uh, in by Theodor Schwartz, and uh, 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 you have the uh, control of the size of the lesion because of the temperature, and that is making you see here. Uh, with a different temperature, the, the side of the region. And that makes you sure what you are doing. A very short uh, video to show what is uh, uh, in an essential tremor. This is the patient that has a sensor tremor. The neurologist is uh, uh, my friend, uh, uh, Eleopra, is, is checking the patient. And um, after the sonification, you see here, that the tremor is gone, and is 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 uh, the control is immediately. And of course, during the procedure that is uh, uh, lasting at three or four hours, uh, you have to make you can make a, a check that is a pre during the uh, the procedure, and after the procedure, you see here the improvement of different things. Uh, the lesioning is very small, very compact, and this is after 24 hours, and this is after one month, and you see that the lesion is staying there. Uh, these are the, uh, the uh, pre and post, the task that you can check. And uh, 
and these are the uh, different target with different indication. These are the indication that today are, let's say, allowed by FDA and CE mark, but uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, possibility to use this technique for other uh, making lesion of also in non-functional disease like small tumors or small, small metastasis. Uh, this, uh, the inter ventral, ventral intermediate nucleus for uh, Parkinson uh, uh, essential tremor, the uh, anterior capsule for, uh, for uh, uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disease, uh, the uh, pallidus internus for Parkinson, as uh, we show, and the subthalamic nucleus for uh, that is the STN for the Parkinson control, and of course, VIM for the essential tremor, as they showed before. Uh, in essential tremor, this is one of the case, and the most important things is that the, you can control the temperature of the lesion and make a control the size of the lesion in function of, the, uh, of this uh, particular technique. The uh, uh, results are both uh, on quality and, and the end, on the end, on the posture, uh, in the tremor, action tremor, and, uh, and the disability score you see here that you have during the time of improvement, the stay, uh, although, uh, as you will show, there is uh, uh, always some failure. Uh, this is a... Uh, Tremor score, you see here that there is immediately is very good and there is a loss of uh, efficacy during the time and the disability score again, uh, five years is uh, a little bit uh, uh, reduced. This uh, uh, line is the uh, effect, immediately effect, and you see there is some patient that are not responder. And that is something that uh, cannot be previewed before, but has to be uh, taught to the patient. We have discussed the patient because uh, during the surgery, it can be a failure. There is no lesioning was possible, or the lesion is present, but the symptom is not gone. Uh, what about the cognitive function? Every lesion in the brain is making change of the uh, connectivity, as was shown for the epilepsy lecture before. And you see here that the uh, cognitive uh, impairment is uh, very limited uh, in, the, in those patients, in, mainly in patients with, with the essential tremor, because if we go to Parkinson, Parkinson is much more complex disease, and, uh, and also there is a cognitive decline during the time. Of course, uh, nobody can uh, in the surgery can do the omelette without breaking the hex. So there is an adverse event also in with the, with the focus ultrasound. Uh, some small uh, and uh, annoying the patient are the frame related, the numbness of where the pin, uh, the infection or the position of, of the of the pin from the, of the frame. Some other are related to the sonication when you make the lesion, and that is uh, the uh, headache, burn of the scalp if the is not cooled enough, and uh, nausea and vomiting uh, can be happens during the surgery, and that can has to be stopped. Some other more uh, more uh, important are related to the lesion to the telemotomy. There is a sensory deficit. Uh, there is some difficulties in speech and swallowing and in ataxia. Uh, this, all this, uh, the, all this side effect was well known when the radiofrequency lesion was done in the past. And, uh, uh, and that is related to the particular lesion of the thalamus on the nuclei of the thalamus. And, uh, uh, and uh, this is a very important and in a way limiting the possibility to do bilateral lesioning. We did some bilateral lesioning in the, in the literature is reported, but as to be the, the interval uh, should be six months or better one year in between one size and the other and the other size. Uh, 
the what about uh, the treatment of Parkinson's disease? As I saw, as I, I say before, the limit of DBS for Parkinson's disease is the age, and uh, the population is getting uh, uh, is getting older, and uh, Parkinson is coming out all in uh, older patient, and uh, that can be a possibility to make the again what Leitin in the 70s was doing, uh, uh, lesioning of the GPI, and that can be monolateral and bilateral if necessary, uh, one or two years later. So one flow chart for Parkinson's disease may, uh, uh, after, after some uh, years of uh, medical treatment, to do a uh, focus ultrasound lesion, subthalamotomy or, or, or uh, GPI lesioning. And if when fluctuation are coming out, had DBS if the age is uh, possible. Um, this is a kind of summary. The advantage or disadvantage of uh, uh, radio frequency thermoblation, radio surgery, lit, as we heard to, uh, early today, can be used also for make lesioning of the thalamus, some very small lesioning, or fuss. Uh, the advantage of the, this last technique is that uh, you have a real time monitoring because you are doing under MRI. All the other ones are uh, uh, limited because uh, of the uh, not immediately control. But of course, the cost of the thermoablation in comparison of the radio surgery of uh, FUS surgery is uh, completely different. And I think that that has to be uh, diffused <laughs> mainly in country in which uh, technology uh, for economical situation is not available. In conclusion, <coughs> the therapy of movement disorder requires a team in which neurosurgeon has to be one of the uh, uh, most important part because the responsibility of the lesion is uh, under his hand as all neurosurgical procedure. Uh, the one of the major problems is to carefully analyze symptom and personality of the patient. And the, the, as you say before, the options are laid, tied up with the, uh, the equipment of different center. And you can choose or can use uh, radiofrequency lesion, DBS, radio surgery, little, uh, or focus ultrasound. The results are very similar. Of course, the, the, for the patient, more modern uh, technology are using, better is for him. But when you, have, you cannot have this kind of uh, facilities, you have to go back and uh, remember that uh, the results are very good. Uh, the other thing is that it has to be uh, uh, the message for the patient is that the treatment is symptomatic. You cannot stop the disease. You stop a symptom. And that is the goal of the mission of functional neurosurgery. And uh, be aware that doctor internet is uh, uh, our enemy and has to be discussed very well with the patient. Uh, this is the, the team of, of the best that you see here, neurologists, neuropsychologists, neuroradiologists and neurosurgeon. This is uh, the, the photos and that's, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Giovanni Brogi, for this outstanding lecture about uh, functional neurosurgery using different techniques, techniques, especially with deep brain stimulation and magnetic resonant imaging uh, focusing with ultrasound. Um, as you mentioned uh, before, it's very important uh, the knowledge of the neuron, deep neuroanatomy of, of, of the brain and um, the proper use of the, the, the last technologies uh, in order to offer to our patients the best um, option to treat their specific pathologies. 
Uh, thank you again, Professor Giovanni, uh, for your beautiful and complete presentations. And there is no time uh, for, for questions uh, because uh, uh, we need to, to pass to the, to the next speaker. But anyway, if some of, uh, of the, the panelists um, or the students want to ask to Professor Giovanni, uh, some question we can use uh, the chat uh, in order to to respond their uh, specific uh, questions to Professor Giovanni. Thank you again, Professor, for your beautiful lecture. And I want to introduce to my partner, Professor Igor Maldonado, in order to present our next speaker. Thank you, Matias. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Professor uh, Philippe Koubes, the next speaker. He's a personal friend and someone who very much contributed to my training as well when I was a resident. Uh, Professor Koubes um, has an impressive history of contributions to the development of a surgical treatment of movement disorders due to a number of genetic syndromes, uh, but also from acquired conditions. Uh, a large part of uh, his research in Montpellier, in the south of France, is dedicated to children, such as genetic dystonia, for instance. Uh, he's also a, a very good singer, and he will gift us today with a lecture in, on this topic. This is his first time on this uh, WFNS uh, Neuroanatomy Committee webinars. So uh, we thank you, Professor Koops, for accepting the invitation. Thanks for coming. It's, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, I have to be sent my mission because I cannot activate presently my communication. Uh, uh, okay. So I have I, no, I no possibility to split my screen with... Okay. Uh, Imad, uh, I think he has to be co-host in order to share his screen, I'm afraid. Of. Yeah, I, I think so, yeah. Imad, you are muted. I will will try. Hi, Professor Philip. Uh, good yeah. to see you. We are trying to get you on the screen. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ramesh is taking care of the host, and uh, we need to bring uh, Professor Philip on. Don't use the. Uh, Professor you. Philip can share the screen. Um, can you share your screen, Professor Philip? Don't say yeah, it's, it's all the panelists. Yeah. You see the green button on your screen? On your, oh yeah, good. Is it okay? Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, it was not possible 10 minutes before. Okay, because they, they opened the screen for you. Wonderful. So I have to come back. If the CT is negative, um, what no. would be your next test? Okay, here we are. Thank you. Uh, I understood that I was participating to some uh, webinar dedicated to young colleagues, and uh, I orientated my, my speech in this way. I'm just going through basic concept in, uh, in MR guided stereotaxy when I've seen that uh, Andres Lozano will be perhaps going into more details in, on indication and results. So uh, something that we have seen also with Professor Broge's presentation is that we are now clearly in the era of MR based direct targeting strategy. And uh, as you know, I've been advocating this orientation very early. It means that uh, everything on the way we choose a target is based on brain MRI quality. Nowadays, it provides high definition images of the patient's own anatomy, which is fundamentally different of Atlas's guided methodology. The first step when uh, we want to implement sub, such protocol, especially for implanting leads in the brain, it's the evaluation of precision of the tool. It's also what we have seen with Professor Broge's presentation. The, the importance of exactly knowing what is our precision 
in small targets deep seated in the brain is nowadays crucial. This must be done regularly on phantom with the frame on. For example, we have been, and this is published, that we have been calculating that we have an in-plane 0.6 millimeter precision, which is uh, quite 50% of the pixel size. We must use 1.5 Tesla because, as I'll show you later, the risk of an acceptable distortion with 3D machines is permanent, with sometimes very big distortion and deviation, which must be clearly uh, known, and this is why I insist on that. And of course, uh, for me, especially in children and especially in patients, uh, demented or ag agitated, like for Huntington disease, uh, general anesthesia is mandatory. For example, here uh, you see on this uh, sketch what can be done. Take, for example, the blue square upstairs and see that the three T T1. This is a Siemens machine uh, we have here uh, with the frame on the Phantom. Uh, show you that the deviation can be of m many millimeters, sometimes th three to four. When you work with a final precision in plane of 0.6, this is not acceptable. You see on the, the B picture, the way we easily can depict that uh, this deviation is actual. Of course, when you want to implement such a method, you must be able to adapt your MRI suit to stereotactic surgery. This is not so easy. It's the reason why I mentioned that. I've been in many centers uh, which are implementing this uh, stereotactic MR guided technology, but the anesthesiologist must be close to the patient and so on. And this is not anymore acceptable in terms of image quality and of image uh, transfer and image security and patient security, excuse me. Don't think that every sequence is equal in terms of precisions. Uh, when you decide with your radiologist to select a specific sequence to work on its improvement, you must evaluate the precision of every sequence. Fusion is can compromise, can, excuse me, uh, image fusion is mandatory also in, for example, STN targeting, but take care. Uh, every protocol also must, can introduce a risk of error and must be evaluated for uh, the risk of deviation you can get. When you target the three millimeter wide STN uh, directly on MR, this is also very important to know what the risk of, uh, of deviation introduced by your protocol of fusion, especially if you use MR that have been acquired days to weeks before, which of course we must avoid. General anesthesia is mandatory in hyperkinetic children. For us, it allows the blood pressure stability control. And uh, of course, it improves patient's comfort. We are now, you know, shortening the length of this type of operation, and uh, this is a big progress with time. You do your intraoperative MR before the targeting. This is the anatomy of the day. It's not the anatomy of two weeks before. For a 0.6 millimeter risk of deviation, this is important to make the assumption that your brain is going to be stable in terms of volume, blood brain volume, especially being a part of it. We here, and I've been always doing that, base this operation on pre-operative, immediate planning, immediate surgery, and then immediate post-operative control. It's not a big challenge to know if you have the MR machine in the, in the room or if it's the next door. But the problem is to get, the objective is to get this control MR 
in the same day with the frame on. In this way, you can have a precise monitoring of your deviation and of the final precision of what you do. MR anatomy must be preoperatively explored not to be surprised the day of surgery by the quality of what you get, because it's not only depending on the machine, but also on the patient. And uh, if we are used to have good quality images in terms of definition in children, it's not always the case, and as everybody knows, in elderly, for example. What you can do also in standard way is to just control uh, the, the frame dimensions to detect unexpected distortions. If you get a point two, point three difference, you know, you can be very confident with what you are doing with your sequence. And during targeting, especially for young colleagues, do not be in a hurry. You must not doubt of anything. Every limit must be clear. When you leave the room, the targeting must be clear in your head. Take your time. And I've been, you know, uh, standardizing the localization of every electrode in, uh, in a given target in that way that after that, for settings introduction, uh, everything is easier. You are not obliged to test every electrode when you know where your electrode is. This is feasible with MR control done with the frame on. Very quickly, uh, I advocate to do now this under general anesthesia because of course we, we can afford it because we do not do um, uh, electrode, uh, micro electrode recordings, uh, but uh, it's also, as I told you before, uh, a much bigger comfort for the patient. When you want to maintain uh, to the end of the operation this 0.5 uh, precision, blood pressure monitoring and brain homeostasia is crucial. Uh, roughly, we maintain the blood pressure systolic in between 10 and 11, uh, not under, not above. And this uh, is uh, only allowed by uh, general anesthesia in a very reliable way. Take care of the risk of epilepsy, especially when you operate on, a secondary, on disease secondary to a brain lesion and in some uh, given uh, genetical disease, because it's, uh, it can be a concern. Uh, we have had uh, one percent seizure. It's, of course, it's very quickly controlled, but this can happen. And uh, we are now planning to uh, extensively prevent this risk by introducing in uh, patients at risk uh, medication before, probably levopiracetam. Don't forget that your frame itself has structural and functional limits. For the Lexol, we work roughly with a 0.4 millimeter in plane also. Simple error can be performed if you don't check your cannula for straightness and rigidity. This is uh, allowed especially by continuous radioscopic monitoring because with this way of, very simple way of uh, continuous control, you very quickly detect uh, if your tool is as straight as you think it is. Optimal duration, as long as you want to maintain a brain homeostasia and constant blood brain volume, uh, is in between 20 to 30 minutes per lead. After that, you clearly see on your uh, monitoring that you have a deviation, which is in between 0.5 and 1 millimeter. But the brain is slowly shifting as long as you have opened the cranium, the skull. In this way, you avoid at maximum the risk of brain shift, the CSF leakage and the pneumocephalia, that sometimes is very extensive when this, the operation is lasting hours. This is what we can get uh, with a profile. This is a facial control of lead position. Uh, clearly, it gives you intraoperatively uh, the localization of your coordinates 
within, of course, the frame fiducials. The control within the target is only uh, given by the MR. Here you have the incision we make. With time, it appears to be very convenient in terms of infectious risk and surgical management, especially when we have to reoperate either for additional leads introduction or for reoperation of any kind. Lead anchoring, uh, it's not a detail. You must not consider that uh, you have been doing a very good job with lead implantation. You are very happy with your control. And then uh, the, the suit, uh, excuse me, what's going on after it? I mean, the device implantation is a secondary operation. It's not true. Uh, you can be matched in big trouble of any kind, mechanical, infectious, uh, if you neglect the fact that this second connection to the IPG, the second time, uh, is not important. In young patients, we often have to reoperate. It can be for, of course, for changing IPG, which is less current now with uh, rechargeable, but also for change, uh, for changing the lead. Uh, some in uh, mean mean lifespan, the lead are uh, ten to twelve years. We have now. Uh, abandoned completely abandoned the idea to use semen for that. And we, we bring great care of fixing uh, the extension connector just laterally to the ball. It means under the same uh, scale incision with screwed mini plate. I'm going to, to show you that here. This is the way we fix it. In this way, in case of traction on the uh, inferior part of, of the lead, you will uh, not be tracking on the electrode of the lead itself. And it's, it's going to break under. And this is important because of course, as you know, uh, reoperating for lead implantation is not the same thing that changing an extension. Just to aspect of uh, post-operative MR, uh, the artifact is, uh, is grossly 2.5 size, fold the size of the lead. Uh, and uh, allow to know, uh, of course, you can see if you have an edema, if you have some blood around, and uh, on the left, you have one uh, lead on the second, you have four leads. And like that, you immediately check where you are and you are not discussing uh, during hours to know which uh, electron must be used. For uh, young colleagues, uh, Usually, it's always possible to wait a few days after general anesthesia before be initiating uh, the electrical modulation, switching on the IPGs. Uh, this is greatly, I told you, facilitated if interpatient's reproducibility of electrode localization is uh, achieved. Usually, we are aligned on the, what is published uh, in the GPI, we have been very early using a wide pulse width. We increase very slowly the voltage. Uh, we, I prefer voltage dependent stimulation, but this, is, um, this, is, this can be discussed. Uh, for STN, we, we are constantly in bipolar mode at the top of the nucleus and for Vim VOP, uh, which is very difficult to segregate. They are very thin nucleus, nuclei. We also are simulating on medium contacts, medium electrodes, excuse me, uh, in bipolar mode. Usually, uh, especially when your uh, patient's fight is going to increase, uh, you will uh, be, become aware quickly that you have no time to play with settings and that the more, the most it is standardized, the most it is reproducible from one patient to another is the better it is. I won't go into details. We uh, have now uh, quite wide experience with this and uh, I've, I've this habit to tell people that movement disorder is still in, uh, in trouble with semantics. Um, you can simply try to analyze the basic muscle tone, differentiating 
spasticity induced by deficit from hyper or hypotonia of uh, subcortical origin, so called dystonia. Uh, every hyperkinetic, it means too much movement. It can be oscillating, not oscillating, coming with voluntary movement on, or being spontaneous, being quick or not. This is dyskinetic. Uh, and uh, this is the symptom to isolate because in uh, my experience here, uh, GPI neuromodulation essentially improve the dyskinetic component of a movement disorder, not improve, is not able to improve isolated dystonia. The, for example, the DYT12 disease with this pure dystonia originated from the cortex is not at all improved by uh, GPI neuromodulation either GPI or uh, and neither STN and VIM who have been trying that in these very difficult patients. So STN is yet, you know, uh, it's, there are not many uh, other indications that Parkinsonism, the past sensitive to Parkinsonism. There are some rare indication in uh, disease with dystonia dyskinesia syndrome, but it's not, it's very specialized and I, I have not time to go into details in that. You had seen before that VMVO pay continuous neuromodulation improves tremor. This is the fundamentals of, uh, of DBS. And overall, especially in patient coming with a movement disorder due to a lesion of the brain, post anoxia, young patient and so on, uh, always think that motor deficit is associated to such disorder and uh, must be separated uh, from what you see as an hypertonia due to dystonia. Uh, spasticity and dystonia in this situation are very frequently associated. And it's sometimes very much challenging is even in experienced hands to separate both uh, category of symptoms. We do not improve presently. It's very difficult, very selected case perhaps, but very rare. It's very difficult to improve pure dystonia by any kind of target we uh, have. I of course advocate for early operation, essentially in early onset disease, but we have seen that we have a trend to operate early on park also. Don't wait, this is a DYT1 patient that we have seen very late. Uh, don't wait for this type of situation, which is always much more challenging for the, the team to, to manage. And finally, uh, I come back to what I was telling you uh, concerning the importance of uh, the second time surgery. I mean, extension and IPG implantation especially when we, be, you, we begin very early in the life of these patients, you will have to reoperate. And the cosmetic uh, concerns are very important. They are young patients and uh, they, of course, appreciate that much not to be with a visible scar, not to be with a visible subcutaneous device. So we do not use a sub... Uh, clavicular localization for these reasons. And uh, we have been uh, extensively using the abdominal area and more recently, but it's now 15 years, uh, the submammary uh, position, which is uh, allowed in, uh, in many situations. And in this situation of submammary localization of the IPG, you don't see anything frontally. So this is much appreciated in this way. Uh, I intended initially to show to you uh, videos, but I was realizing that this was uh, diffused on internet and uh, I only have the authorization of my patients for showing that in uh, controlled medical um, attendance. And I want to apologize, but uh, I cannot... Uh, diffuse that on, on the YouTube uh, internet, but uh, 
if uh, you want to see some of these, I can be uh, contacted separately uh, in given disease to, to show these videos. Uh, I hope you understand this and uh, uh, I wanted to, to show you that, but it's impossible to me. Thank you for your attention. I hope that I've been fulfilling uh, your expectancy in terms of, uh, of trying to teach my experience to younger colleagues and uh, I'm available for questions if I have time. Thank you, for Professor Koops, for this very, very clear presentation. I think we have time for one short question. From the panelists, from the audience. Okay, uh, I don't see any um, request for um, question. Uh, thank you very much for this very clear uh, presentation. You know, uh, this um, uh, you really make us understand that uh, this situation is. Uh, in the pediatric population, hypersynectic patients, adolescents uh, deserves uh, a specific reasoning and uh, specific concepts and the, the technique must be dedicated to it, not just important, imported from a general um, DVS surgery. Uh, on, on only one uh, um, small uh, question. When you mentioned the uh, distortion on MRI uh, can be uh, very um, important up to uh, two to three millimeters, Th that distortion is uh, smaller in the center of the field of view, right? No, uh, no, no. It's, a, it's always mo more constant at the periphery of the field. And it, it's especially the place where your fiducials are. Hmm. So if you are not aware that you have some this type of deformation, you are going to to give uh, a wrong uh, origin to your stereotactic space and uh, of course modern software are supposed to give you uh, what they call precision but it's not, it's just uh, a, a quick correlation and you must be very careful to to depict this deviation and the best way is to simply Check for the dimension of uh, of the fiducials before you mm -hmm. you make your uh, targeting in the plane where you select your target, and usually um, you can clearly see that. But of course, um, as I told you, this must be done before. It can happen that your machine is uh, has not been in good maintenance, or and you can uh, you, you, they have an accidental variation in the field homogeneity and so on. But this is usually very rare. But this um, MR evaluation and sequence evaluation must be performed before on phantom. Mm -hmm. And every time you see something unusual during the operation, you must go back to, to MR engineers and, and correct it. Uh, this is a, a constant uh, preoccupation. It's a daily permanent preoccupation. Okay. How do you think a high field MRI is going to affect your field? You know, seven it's not, it's and... not, I, I don't see a way, but I'm not an engineer, but I've been discussing extensively for many years with them here. Uh, I don't see how we can uh, correct the, the distortion induced by a 3T magnet uh, because you are an, an anatomist and you know that if you see a deformation, and if you correct this deformation with uh, software processing, you will never know what you are doing in the deformed area. So I think that the best way to be sure to have the patient's own anatomy under the eyes is just to work with a 1.5, mm -hmm. which is nowadays a very good quality uh, mach machine. Uh, I'm working here with uh, a Siemens magnet. So I can, all the calculations I've shown you have been performed on, on this type of machine uh, without any advertising of, of my own, you can imagine. But uh, this must be done on, um, on a, every suit in every center before uh, doing MR guided store taxi. Uh, 0.5 millimeter precision is 
is what we need. We don't need much more than that. Mm. So if we if we succeed in improving this in daily practice, um, this will be good. This will be good. I think we do not need absolutely to 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 plan to do through a taxi with uh, with three TMR because we have the frame in the field, and uh, this is a, a big limitation. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for your participation. You are welcome. So uh, let's move to the next presentation. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Andres Lozano, even if uh, he doesn't need an introduction for the most of us. He's the chairman of Division of Neurosurgery of the University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Lozano has an also an active uh, laboratory and research um, works uh, dedicated to the study of functional neurosurgery and uh, neurodegeneration. It has works published in a great number of manuscripts, chapters, and five books. Um, among his uh, research topics are, of course, deep brain stimulation, mapping of deep structures, and also identification of new targets for DBS. He trained at doses of neurosurgeons with these techniques. Uh, we'll have the pleasure to listen to him today. Uh, to listen to his lecture in, um, on trends and options in neurosurgical management of movement disorders. Professor Lozano, thank you for joining us, please. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Maldonado, and um, it's great to be part of this WFNS uh, session and to be involved in um, uh, uh, interacting with the young, uh, the young neurosurgeons. Uh, I also want to thank um, um, uh, Professor Kanan and, and Benis for the invitation, and uh, it was wonderful to hear Professor Broji and Kubes uh, before me, who have uh, covered uh, many of the elements uh, that are important in the field of functional neurosurgery as it applies to movement disorders. So I'm sharing my screen. I'm, I'm assuming you can all see it. Um, I'm going to emphasize uh, advances in uh, the field of movement disorder surgery, uh, both uh, in the DBS field and in the field of focused ultrasound. So there'll be some overlap, uh, but some things also different from what you've heard. And so uh, when we think of uh, some of the advances, and I'll, I'll select a few of them, uh, the patients are reluctant to have surgery, uh, many of them. And uh, I think it's important to try to improve the comfort uh, of the patients. And with this in mind, um, the many more operations are being done uh, under general anesthesia now. Uh, this does not preclude recording. You can do perfectly good microelectrode recordings under general anesthesia, but the patients feel more comfortable. You lose quite a bit of information, of course, because you don't get the feedback from the patients. Rechargeable batteries now are uh, established. Uh, soon we will have smaller and skull implanted systems, so you will not have to tunnel, uh, but rather you'll implant the IPG in the skull. And also there's now the possibility of remote uh, or internet programming of DBS. So this is now available in China and is being spread throughout the world where the patient no longer has to come to the clinic, but rather they're at home and through a video and through uh, electronic programming through the internet, you are able to program uh, the devices. And so this is uh, in countries that are large. Uh, this uh, is important because it means that the patients don't have to come uh, to the center for, for their programming. With respect to the surgical techniques uh, and um, imaging is, is crucial, as you've heard Professor Kubes speak, and we have better imaging now, and I'll give you a few examples of that. And also we now have uh, increasingly the possibility of intraoperative imaging with MRI. And so these are two trends that are becoming uh, important uh, in our field. In terms of improved outcomes, we now have uh, more flexibility with our stimulation because we can guide the steering of the currents uh, with directional stimulation. Rather than stimulating continuously, we can stimulate in an adaptive or a closed loop method only when it's required. And in the future, we can, uh, when we're dealing with Parkinson's disease, we realize that there are other elements, for example, cognitive deficits, uh, psychiatric deficits. And so in the future, will go after not only the motor aspects of Parkinson's disease, but we will also start to attack the uh, cognitive and uh, the mood aspects of uh, Parkinson's disease. And this may mean that we will target not one circuit, not just the motor circuit, but also cognitive circuits and uh, mood circuits. And this may mean that we will need 
multifocal VBS uh, to stimulate different, different circuits of the brain. So let's go over some examples of some of these advances. And uh, one of the advances, of course, is the trend towards a higher strength uh, field MRIs. And this is becoming uh, useful, particularly in preoperative uh, testing. Uh, and here's an example of a unit uh, in, uh, in Korea. And you'll see the difference between the seven Tesla seen on the left uh, and the three Tesla and the 1.5 Tesla. And you'll see that indeed uh, you're able to define much better the STN, uh, the Nigra, and different parts of the globus pallidus with seven Tesla. So I think that this is now, it's no longer a question of targeting the nucleus, but also targeting sub compartments of the nucleus. And I think for the first time, we are now able to see sub compartments of the nucleus. And so uh, I think that this will help us in more precisely targeting. We will have to deal with this issue of with increasing strength of the field comes increasing distortion. So that has to be resolved, but there's no doubt that we can see these targets better with increasing field strength. Another uh, development is uh, novel sequences for MRI. And I'll just point out this uh, particular sequence, which is called QSM. And what you'll see here is that with QSM, the STN uh, becomes white. And you see this almond shaped structure in white. And you also see the putamen, the external segment of the globus pallidus, and the internal segment with its subdivision. So this is at 3T, and just using different sequences, it is possible to get more anatomical detail and to help in the targeting of these structures. So these are two examples of how imaging is improving the targeting of uh, deep structures in the brain in the context of Parkinson's disease. Now, one of the uh, crucial elements in uh, surgery is you have to be within one millimeter of the target to get a good result. And in, in fact, if you are, are two or more millimeters away from the ideal target, then often it is the difference between a, a success and a disaster or uh, not even being able to help the patient. And in, in this particular example, you have a, a axial figure uh, through uh, the STN and you'll see that immediately adjacent to the end, there's the capsule, immediately behind there's the medial lemniscus, uh, the third nerve fibers, et cetera. So if the current spreads uh, by one or two millimeters beyond the border of the STN, you get into difficulties. And this is where it would be great if we could sculpture the current, if we could shape the current so that it better conforms with the STN and we avoid the current spread to adjacent eloquent structures that would give side effects if they were stimulating. This is where current steering comes in. And so in the, in the example here on the extreme right, you'll see that the electrodes are split and they're not rings, but rather split. And in this example, there are multiple dots. And what you do is of course, you choose which direction to drive the current in. And in, in this case, you can steer the current. So in the example of the STN, you can stimulate in all directions as in uh, the figure here on the left, or you can stimulate in one direction or the other. And in so doing, you can uh, carpenter the field of tissue that's activated and you can avoid side effects and get the most uh, stimulation within uh, the target nucleus. So, so this is becoming a very useful technique uh, to uh, be used. And most centers now are switching towards these directional leads uh, rather than these uh, unidirectional or ring leads. Now, another uh, uh, development is that instead of stimulating constantly, there will be a trend towards stimulating only on an as required basis. And so patients with Parkinson's, for example, they sometimes have tremor, sometimes they don't, sometimes they're rigid, sometimes they're feeling fine. And so you really only want to stimulate when it is required. And as an example, here's a single neuron, a uh, microelectric recording of a single neuron, the same neuron, uh, at 10 minute intervals. Uh, we, and this neuron is recorded in the top when the patient is well, and the neuron is firing in this sporadic way. And then a few minutes later, the patient starts developing tremor. And you see that the neuron is now firing into this os oscillatory pattern with clusters of action potentials uh, five times per second. And so when the patient is well and the neuron is firing normally on the top, you do not need to stimulate. But you do need to stimulate when the patient has tremor, or is rigid and the neurons are firing abnormally. And so the idea here is not to stimulate when the neurons are, are functioning well and only to stimulate when the neurons are misbehaving 
And this is the basis of adaptive stimulation where you detect using local field potentials, abnormal firing of the neurons, and then this triggers the turning on of the stimulation. The rest of the time when the neurons are behaving, when the patient is doing well, you do not need to stimulate. And the consequences of this is that if you have an automatic or on-demand stimulation, it's probably more physiological. Why would you want to stimulate the brain when it is functioning normally? You do not want to do that. It just would interfere with normal function. We only want to stimulate the brain when it is functioning abnormally. And so this means that we would only stimulate during these, these epochs that, that have pathological behavior and when the patient has symptoms. One of the consequences of this is that we estimate that you will only need to stimulate about 25 to 30% of the time. And what this means is that your batteries are gonna last three to four times longer if you're only stimulating a quarter of the time. So this is another added advantage of this closed loop or on-demand stimulation is the improvement in the life of the batteries. Now, one of the major problems that our neurology colleagues face, and one of the reasons that they don't necessarily like DBS is because the, uh, st the programming of DBS is extremely complex. On average, it takes uh, the patient several visits and uh, maybe up to 15 or 16 hours of stimulation back and forth. And it's trial and error. You stimulate um, and you send the patient home and then they come back in a week or two and then you readjust it and so on. So it's a trial and error, hit and miss. And this is getting even more complicated because now there are many more contacts in the electrodes. So for example, if you look at the electrodes here towards the, the right, you'll see that there are many more contacts. And so the number of possibilities of contacts you have to choose, if you had to test all of them, uh, you would spend hours and hours trying to test uh, the various uh, contacts. In addition, there are many disorders, for example, dystonia, as Professor Koops has described, where you do not see a major immediate effect. The effects are delayed and are progressive. And so when you stimulate, you never know that you have the right stimulation because you have to wait to see an effect. And if you don't wait long enough, if you lose your patience and you change the stimulation too quickly, you have the horrific possibility that you had a fantastic stimulation setting, but you were too impatient and you go away to a lousy stimulation setting because you simply did not wait long enough for a clinical effect. And so what we need is a biomarker of success, telling you that indeed you have stimulated and you have produced the right engagement of the brain circuits and that this then will produce the right clinical benefit. So this is what we need uh, to do. So we need to develop new ways of programming the stimulators. So with this in mind, we are considering using fMRI as a biomarker for stimulation. So we've done fMRI in uh, over hundred patients now, and this is turning on the DBS in the MR, turning it on and off in the MR and looking at what areas of the brain are activated when you turn on the uh, DBS uh, electrodes. And of course, uh, the idea is that when you have the right setting, you are gonna produce a signature of brain activation, a pattern of brain activation that is distinct from when you are stimulating at an inappropriate target or in an inappropriate way. So our hypothesis is that when you are stimulating correctly, you will get a unique signature of fMRI pattern, which will be different and distinct from inappropriate stimulation. So we've done this in 20 patients. And uh, the way we do this is the patients go into the MRI, they have bilateral STN, for example, and we uh, go contact by contact, we choose one contact, for example, if we know that this is the best contact, contact two here is the best contact, we will put the patient in with the best contact and stimulate 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off for a total of six minutes, and then generate an fMRI picture. We then go to the next contact that is three millimeters away or the next one and the next one. So we get, what is the picture of fMRI pattern that we get at each one of these contacts? Knowing which is the best contact, in this case, number two here, versus the non-optimal contacts. And when we do this, we, we indeed we get a, a signature. So if you look at this picture over here on uh, the left panel A, you'll see that when we are stimulating at the best contact, we get a deactivation in the bold signal in the primary motor cortex seen here in blue, and also in the contralateral cerebellum. And we get an activation at the site of stimulation in the subthalamic area. So this is the signature of success. If you move away to an adjacent contact where the clinical results are not favorable, 
then you get a very different pattern. You do not see very much activation in M1 at all. And now you see activation in other areas of the brain. So we think that we can distinguish the signature, the pattern that exists of fMRI activation when you're stimulating in the correct contact and when you're stimulating in the wrong contact. If this is true, then it means that uh, if, if, since we know the pattern of brain activation is correlated with a good clinical outcome, then perhaps we could use that as the endpoint of programming. Instead of relying on the patient's clinical response, the objective of the programming would be to generate this pattern in the brain with fMRI, and that would be the endpoint. And this would be the same for Parkinson's and for dystonia, where you no longer care what the immediate clinical response is, but rather what you're trying to achieve is activating the circuit in this pattern and because that correlates with success. So this is what we've done. So we've taken 20 patients, 19 patients that have been operated before they are programmed. And here the objective was to adjust the stimulation until we get what we think is the correct pattern. So we've done this now in 19 patients, and this is going to be published next week in Nature Communications. And basically what we see is that we are able to stimulate the patients to achieve this contact. And then we leave the patient on the setting. We then send the patient to the neurologist and tell the, the neurologist, okay, you now forget about the fMRI, you don't see that. You also stimulate the patient and choose the best contact that you think is best. And we compare the results of the fMRI programming to the neurologist programming. And to our surprise, in 90% of cases, the neurologist chose the same contact that we chose with the fMRI. So we think that we now have a way of choosing the right contacts and choosing the way of stimulating. We've done this with Parkinson's disease. We have the same with dystonia now, where we feel that we can choose the right contact based on the pattern of brain activity. This fMRI takes one hour to do with the patient in the magnet. And so we think that it has the possibility of shortening the programming time. And instead of relying on trial and error, sending the patient home with one setting, coming back with another, now we are going to do a clinical trial to see whether we can get away with doing an fMRI session and using that to determine the programming without the neurologist being directly involved in the programming sessions. So this is where we're heading with fMRI uh, programming. So in conclusion to this uh, section with the fMRI program, we know that the optimal contacts uh, have engagement of the motor circuit, and we know that the pattern of brain responses of the optimal contacts and settings differ from the pattern generated on fMRI in the non-optimal contacts. And these findings could be used for fMRI-based DBS programming, NPD, and importantly, in other disorders like dystonia, like depression, where there's a very long delay, sometimes weeks or months, until you, between the stimulation and the clinical benefit. The other possibility that this brings is that it, it brings the possibility of in the future having automated programming, very much like the Google self-driving car. You could imagine putting the patient in the MR and with an iterative and feedback loop, you could think of programming until you get the pattern of brain activation that is required. And the MRI speaking to the IPG in, in this iterative way, generating a pattern of stimulation that produces the optimal fMRI signal. So that's what I was gonna tell you about fMRI and programming. And now I wanna to move to ultrasound uh, briefly. And I know that Professor Broji has spoken about this, but he's emphasized making lesions with ultrasound. But there are three ways in which ultrasound is now being used in neurosurgery. One of them is of course, to make therapeutic brain lesions and ablation as, as we've heard, but we can also use ultrasound to stimulate the brain very much like transcranial magnetic stimulation, for example. And the advantage here is that the ultrasound can reach deep structures, can reach eight centimeters into the brain. Uh, so this is a form of DBS, if you like, non-invasive DBS, because we can reach deep structures. And thirdly, we can also use the ultrasound to open up the blood-brain barrier to deliver uh, various drugs and, uh, uh, and chemotherapy, et cetera. So let me briefly go over some of these uh, issues. So you've talked about making lesions in the brain. And here's an example of a thalamotomy done. Uh, I won't go into the details, uh, but um, I think uh, this kind of, my cursor is having trouble here. I think I'm gonna skip the slides, the video. So basically a patient with severe tremor and uh, you can see them there. Okay. 
and he goes into the uh, MR and he couldn't he couldn't hold a glass of water before. Where the effect is crystal clear. Okay, so now he can drink water. So this is immediate, right? I asked him when's the last time you could drink water with a cup and he said 10 years ago. So this is a thalamotomy with focus ultrasound. There are several other targets uh, in the basal ganglia, including BIM, including STN, including GPI and the palatothalamic tract seen here. And there are various centers that are doing uh, these operations, uh, including in Korea, uh, in Spain, in Switzerland, et cetera. Uh, in Madrid, they are doing STN lesions uh, using uh, focus ultrasound as well. So this is clearly something that is moving along. Now, uh, you've heard Professor Brogy say that uh, neurosurgeons were too scared to do bilateral lesions. Well, those days are finished. We've now started doing bilateral thalamotomies. And here's an example of our first 10 patients uh, who have had bilateral thalamotomies done with focus ultrasound. And uh, you'll see that the first uh, lesion uh, is uh, the one with the arrow, and the second lesion is the one with the star. So you see that in general, the uh, second lesion tends to be smaller. We are more conservative. Uh, and also we make the second lesion higher up in the thalamus. So we also have asymmetric lesions. We always leave a minimum of six months between lesion one and lesion two. I have been surprised how uh, well tolerated these lesions are. Uh, and I think that with the improved targeting uh, and with the, the extra care, I think that the realm of making bilateral lesions with focus ultrasound has to be re-examined. Uh, and I think that the previous dogma and the previous uh, fright that we had of making bilateral lesions of the brain has to be re-examined carefully uh, and try to optimize uh, the targeting so that we can produce clinical benefits without causing any serious adverse effects. So I think this is the new, uh, new possibility. We now in our center have radio frequency lesioning, we have DBS, we have radio surgery with gamma knife and we have MR focus ultrasound. And we now give the patient this menu, uh, like going to the restaurant, we say, okay, you have tremor. Uh, there are four items on the menu. You can choose uh, uh, option one, or number two, number three, or number four. Uh, and the, for the patient with tremor, the majority of them about 80 or 90% of them are choosing focus ultrasound over DBS, over radio frequency, and over gamma knife. So it has really shifted uh, for patients with tremor, it has really shifted. And now 90% uh, of the patients with tremor in our center are getting focus ultrasound. They prefer focus ultrasound to the other modalities of treatment. And, and I think that now we have data from Insight Tech, which produces the uh, focus ultrasound machines. And worldwide now, there are more thalamotomies done with focus ultrasound for tremor than there are DBS for tremor. So focus ultrasound has overtaken DBS uh, in the treatment of tremor. Uh, and this is a new, a new uh, trend. It has still not overtaken DBS in the treatment of Parkinson's disease uh, for the GPI or the, or, the, uh, or the STN, but certainly for thalamus and tremor, uh, the new leader uh, is focus ultrasound for unilateral, and we will see whether it is safe and reasonable to move to <clears throat> bilateral uh, focus ultrasound uh, in the future. Another important uh, aspect of the ultrasound is that it can be used for stimulation. And here we have a single channel probe and we can stimulate both the surface of the brain. So you can use it for mapping, uh, <laughs> for non-invasive mapping, or you can stimulate the depth of the brain because the ultrasound can reach six or eight uh, centimeters deep uh, into the brain and the maximum uh, acoustic power is delivered at the depth, not at the surface, but rather at the depth. So this is a way of delivering DBS through the skull without uh, putting a probe in the brain. We can, we can focus it deep into the brain. So just to prove to you that one can use ultrasound to stimulate, this is an, an experiment in animals um, and it involves uh, stimulation of a rat. And you can see that uh, ultrasound is being applied at one pulse per second. And you can see that this produces a cortical spinal tract contraction in this rat. So it is very clear that ultrasound can stimulate the nervous system. 
So we are doing this now in humans uh, uh, to stimulate the depths uh, of, uh, of the brain. We are targeting the globus pallidus and the STN uh, using focused ultrasound acutely to stimulate acutely. So what does this mean? It means that we can use focus ultrasound to stimulate the cortex of the brain. And we could, for example, use it to map the motor system, speech, sensory function, et cetera. But interestingly, in the field of DBS, perhaps we can use focus ultrasound to stimulate deep nuclear structures. And in this way, we might be able to predict what might be the consequences of DBS. So before doing DBS, you might be able to see what might be the benefit of DBS by applying this kind of focus ultrasound. And in the future, you might think that maybe we could apply this chronically. So instead of applying it just uh, uh, on a session by session basis, we could implant an ultrasound transducer in the skull and stimulate to the depths of the brain in a way to stimulate DB, uh, like, like DBS, but without putting intervening hardware between the skull and the target. So this is another interesting possibility is perhaps in the future, we can use ultrasound as a form of deep brain stimulation. And this can be done, there's a company called Cathera, which makes ultrasound transducers, and you place the transducers in a burr hole, and then you could aim the ultrasound to the depth of the brain. So this would be an implant, which would involve only a burr hole and uh, placing uh, the transducer in the skull. No wire would go into the parenchyma of the brain. This would be an extra dural procedure. So this is not in use yet, but it is a theoretical possibility in the future to use ultrasound uh, for DBS. Finally, uh, if you co-administer bubbles, micro bubbles in, intravenously with DBS and you apply ultrasound, the bubbles will expand and contract. And this will lead to a breakage of the tight junctions between the endothelial cells. And this will open the blood brain barrier. So once the blood brain barrier is open, then a number of interesting possibilities exist. You can deliver genes, you can deliver trophic factors, proteins, oligonucleotides, antibodies, and even cells. Uh, so this is used mostly now in their clinical trials of trying to enhance the delivery of chemotherapeutic agents. And for example, in this trial from a group in France, from Paris, you'll see that they are opening the blood-brain barrier with one of these implants that is put in permanently to, and you see here on the right, they are applying ultrasound and they, they see that there's gadolinium extravasation where the arrows are. And this indicates that the ultrasound has uh, opened the blood-brain barrier, and this then allows for the additional delivery of chemotherapeutic agents through the area of blood-brain barrier opening. It's estimated that the blood-brain barrier can stay open for several hours, up to 24 hours uh, at specific doses, and then it will reseal. So it might be necessary to repeat this type of treatment on an ongoing basis. So in conclusion then, we've talked about some of the advances in DBS and some of the advances in ultrasound. It seems like the ultrasound might appear to some like a step backwards. You know, the, the, the big advent of DBS is that, the big advantage is that it's reversible and it's not making a lesion. But now it looks like we're going backwards uh, in time, back to the old days when we were making lesions uh, in the brain. And so indeed with the focus ultrasound, we are making lesions, but of course it's very convenient for the patient because it's non-invasive, it's done as an outpatient. And there are many patients who uh, would not accept to have a burr hole or to have DBS, but they will accept to have focus ultrasound. So what this means is that the number of patients that we can treat is higher because the barrier to having surgery is le lesser because the patient's uh, attitude towards the surgery is more favorable. And many patients who would never agree to anything will agree to ultrasound. Uh, and so we now have the possibility of treating more patients. So I think this is a good, a good procedure. We generally treat three patients per day uh, making these lesions and it's done as an outpatient procedure. Uh, so it's quite, quite uh, uh, efficacious. There is also an interesting blurring between of the boundaries between neurology, radiology and neurosurgery. There are some centers where the radiologists want to take over the focus ultrasound, other centers where the neurologists do and other centers where the neurosurgeons do. And I think that this is something where if we do not pay attention and we do not maintain leadership that the other specialties will take over and take this away from us. So it's something for us to uh, keep in mind as neurosurgeons. The first indications for ultrasound are, are tremor, but several new indications are in development, including not only making lesions, and we've emphasized the movement disorders, but obviously you can also make lesions uh, to treat 
epilepsy, amygdala hypocampectomy. In the future, we can make lesions for trigeminal neuralgia, et cetera. So there are many other things that we could use. And the advantage of ultrasound over gamma knife is that the effects are immediate, not in a delayed fashion. So you can titrate the dose in near real time. So this is one of the things in the future is to expand the indications for lesioning to other uh, pathologies, but also to incorporate the possibility of using ultrasound as a stimulation modality, both for stimulating the surface of the brain and for deep structures. And finally, to use ultrasound also to uh, open up the blade bar barrier to, de uh, to deliver important biological molecules and chemotherapy in the brain. So I envisage that there will be many new developments in the field of focus ultrasound and that there will be a large number of neurologic and neurosurgical conditions that might be able to be treated with ultrasound. And with that, I wanna thank my colleagues, uh, my many uh, students, and I wanna thank you for the kind invitation and for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Lozano. It was very, very interesting. Your lecture was uh, beautifully, uh, how can I say, uh, turn it to the future. Um, I think Professor Kanan wants to make a question. Well, I won't pass this time without uh, saying that we are blessed to have you, Andreas, with us. And I think the neurosurgical community is blessed to have uh, somebody like you who is moving the, the field forward. And uh, there is somebody has opened his, uh, if we can close the other microphone. And uh, the neurosurgical community is blessed to have you, somebody like you, who's advancing the field. You have not only opened the blood-brain barrier with the focus ultrasound, but you have opened our eyes and mind for the uh, new innovation you have always brought to our attention. And I think uh, you are the more fastest uh, advanced uh, branch of the neurosurgery moving forward. Uh, thank you again for this uh, and uh, for being with us. And I'd like to thank also Professor Cops for giving the essentials for the young neurosurgeons uh, to be aware of this field and to start moving into this field so we won't lose it for other discipline. Uh, but I have one concern that you are putting the neurology out of work, uh, Andreas and uh, you might get more enemies, so we have to be careful to protect you. Uh, I leave the venue for the others if they have comment or questions. Uh, Ramesh. Thank you, uh, Professor Lasano. That was a wonderful talk. And as Sima said, you opened uh, not only the problem barrier, but our eyes also. Um, I may be a naive, naive question to ask really. Um, you, you we worried about losing out many branches of neurosurgery to other specialists, including skull-based surgery or vascular surgery. Again, you worried about uh, losing out to neurologists or radiologists to this functional surgery. With the con is there any concern for any side effects or complications related to focus ultrasound by you know, uh, opening up the blood brain barrier causing hemorrhage or even lesioning causing hemorrhage? In that case, it will be always in our hands. So what do you say? No, that, that's quite right. I mean, the in the future, maybe we will no longer have the same type of specialties. We will become specialists in tumors and oncology, or maybe specialists in vascular. And we will increase our breadth of practice uh, to involve you know, medications, uh, surgery, invasive, non-invasive, and so on. So I think, I think that uh, what's important is the knowledge uh, of the practitioner, their ability to select patients appropriately, to deliver the therapy, and to deal with complications of the therapy, as you point out, because all of these things have complications, as you can imagine. So provided that one either works in a team or one has access and expertise to that and, and the proper training, then uh, we, will, we will be okay. I think that we will have to have, for example, if, if the gamma knife or focus ultrasound or anything becomes a mainstay, uh, a main discipline, then people will have to do fellowships and, and learn focus ultrasound, and they may do fellowships, uh, and they may be neurologists that want to do fellowships or radiologists, very much as has occurred in interventional neuroradiology, right? Where we now have neurologists and radiologists and neurosurgeons yeah. sharing a common platform. So the same may occur in other uh, disciplines within neurosurgery where uh, there will be many entry points, many on-ramps to the highway, 
uh, but uh, being on the highway and being, you know, going in the right direction, doing the right thing is very important. Absolutely. I think it's very wise um, advice, especially to the younger neurosurgeons who are wondering what the future of neurosurgery is going to be so that they can position themselves in the right pathway when, you, when they think about the future. Thank you. Professor Rosano, I was, uh, uh, regarding uh, fMRI, I was wondering, um, um, the uh, fMRI response uh, is probably dynamic, right? Because uh, the, the way uh, the network, motor network is going to respond is uh, can change with time. Maybe it will be useful for follow-up in the future, or maybe the, uh, the response you get just after uh, immediate post-operative one will not be exactly the same after. And uh, um, I, I would like to just to, uh, comment on this. And uh, I have a personal curiosity is about uh, white matter targets. Uh, we know that I have worked with that uh, in the past for with the Fornix, for example. Could you please uh, say a word on that? Yeah, so, th so the fMRI uh, results I'm showing are extremely robust. So for example, if you move your hand, you get activation of the motor cortex. With the DBS, you get very much stronger, like five to 10 times more activation. The signal strength is very strong. So these are non-physiological activations. These are supra activations. So there's nothing subtle about it. And that's why we can put the patient in for 30 seconds and get a, get a response that is very, very bold. With respect to patients that are newly operated and uh, patients that have been implanted for a year, Interestingly, we get a very similar pattern of activation of the fMRI if you simulate the same structure, whether you stimulate it acutely or after a long delay, because we are talking about stimulating a circuit. And whether you're in a circuit early after the surgery or late uh, in a delayed fashion after the surgery, it's the same circuit. And so we're still getting a very similar, similar pattern. With respect to uh, the axons and the pathways, I mean, the axons are the future. Uh, we are going to shift uh, towards the highways of the brain. Uh, and you know we are dealing with disorders that involve circuits in the brain, not one target, not one cortical area, but many. So when we're talking about Parkinson's disease, we, are, we need to influence the primary motor cortex, supplementary motor cortex, premotor cortex. So we need to influence all this. When we're talking about depression. We need cingulate. We need orbital frontal. You know, we, need, we need dorsolateral prefrontal. So we need to influence circuits. So the idea is to go to a hub, like a bicycle hub, and stimulate at the hub. And then the activity from that hub will propagate along the spokes, along the radiuses, along the, along the pathways to reach the terminal fields. So in the future, we will emphasize more and more a knowledge of the connectivity of the axons of the highways that we need to, do, to use to get to where we want to go. And in many cases, we want to go to many areas of the brain so we have to find a place of confluence where the, the carrefour, the, the intersection of all these highways, so we can put a single electrode there and get spread to the targets of the brain that we need to influence to get a benefit for the patients. Thank you. I don't see any more uh, questions. Yes. I guess. Professor Lozano, there is uh, a question from one participant, Alexandru Andruska. Uh, question for Professor Lozano. For patient with uh, Parkinson's disease, does uh, focus, uh, focused ultrasound also good for bradykinesia? Okay, so that's an excellent question. So, uh, if, so for tremor, we go to the thalamus. If you have a bradykinesia, we go to the STN or the globus pallidus. So we can get an improvement in uh, the bradykinesia and the akinesia and the rigidity by going to either the globus pallidus, the subthalamic nucleus, or the structure in between to uh, the pallidothalamic tract. So it is possible to uh, choose the best target based on the patient's symptoms. When it's tremor, it's thalamus. When it's bradykinesia, it's GPI or STM. Okay. Excellent lecture, Professor Lozano. Uh, greetings from Mexico. Muchas gracias, Nice to see you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I ask uh, Imad, Professor Kanan, our chairman, to. I think it's a wonderful session, and I'd like to thank all the speakers for their uh, great contribution in all aspects of 
for the epilepsy and for the uh, movement disorder. I'd like to conclude that session by having a picture of all the uh, faculties. Can we have them on the on the board? I don't see. I see Professor Touré. Oh, here he is. Yeah, I'd like him to be not his name but himself. Okay. So without further ado, thank you very much, and we appreciate your contribution, and we look forward for more future collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Big thank smile. You. As, uh, where is uh, Pablo? Pablo is not here to take the picture with us. I have taken a picture, Remat. so I hope I can. Okay, okay, we'll take another one because I don't see him. Maybe I'll take one more picture if I can get everyone smiling. Um, yeah, ready? Uh, one more second. Let me just. Uh, okay, got it. Thank you. It was a great session. Yes, yeah. sir. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Congratulations. Bye, Imad. Bye, see you. Bye, bye, bye. Close off. Yeah.